Here's seven. He's in selected. Freiburg goes for the kill. He's going to pick it up. If just exists the right, he's going to win the round. There's no time. Oh, my God. Welcome to another edition of By The Numbers, uh, the CSGO edition, uh, created, conceived and everything else by Alpha Draft, our wonderful friends. I'm Richard Lewis, your host for this show. With me uh, is a very sleepy Thorin, of course, he's still out in Korea. What time is it where you are, mate? Four o'clock. In the morning? Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. I'll keep, I'll, you know, I'll people, always, people always sell my videos, right? Because like... Because sometimes, if especially in, in the heat here, like I just like touch my nose all the time or scratch it or whatever, mm -hmm. people always say like, yeah, 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 he's well coked up, isn't he? Look at the way he's talking. I tell you what, mate, I wish I was right now. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be on it right now, you know. I'd be like 80s Belushi or something. But instead, like you say, I, I'm a bit sonambulant right now. So hopefully, hopefully no one I can enrage some NA fans. That might actually be like hiring me, you know. Well, mate, this is the show to do it because actually, I've got to be honest. I was a little bit, uh, I was a little bit dreading doing this one. Um, if it wasn't for the fact, as I said, the Alpha Draft and my new best friends, obviously, it's our sort of weekly bro time that we get to spend together. So that's always a big draw. Uh, but um, yeah, it, this is going to be tough because I remember last week, and we pretty much wrote off <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all, all of the NA teams. I said CLG should change their name to Team Fuck Our Lives, I think it was, officially. Yeah. Um, you said Cloud9 probably is going to get shit on. Um, so, it, in a lot of ways, this show isn't just going to be about sort of assessing that, uh, our, our predictions and our validity as analysts. But also, I mean, we might have to maybe give some credit to North American teams, which clearly isn't in our nature. So... I guess let's let's talk about it then. This is the big event that happened. Uh, I am, of course, talking about the um, ESL, ESEA Pro League Finals in Cologne. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll start by talking about the games and then we'll get into some of the logistical issues that hit the event. I think that's probably the right way around to do it. <clears throat> that way we can get all our atonement, our appeasement, all of that stuff out of the way to basically denigrate ourselves and then we can move on to doing what we do best, which is, of course, criticizing people. So let's talk about this tournament overall. First of all, it has got to be said, there were a, a number of upsets, uh, most notably the form of Envious, which really seems to have dipped uh, quite drastically between tournaments. Uh, Gfinity, we said, yeah, they looked beatable, but they were doing just enough. They made it to the final, and then they looked imperious against NIP. There was none of that form here uh, in the ESL ESEA Pro League. They lost to Cloud9 in a best of one, then a best of three. Uh, they did they did decent enough against Luminosity, I suppose, but you would have expected the envious we saw in the finals of Gfinity to run over them like a, st a steam train. It wasn't quite that convincing, although not far off. So let's talk about them. What what what's up with the our Gallic brothers? Yeah, well, I mean, what what was great was obviously because they played Cloud Nine twice, and the second time around was the best of three. Actually, that really helped. What's funny is anyone who liked the upset in the best of one and was complaining that like defending the format, like oh, don't say like best of one's not that good, etc. Well, what's good is by seeing it in a best of three, we saw that it was more legit. It actually helped prove the very case of the best of one upset and, and show that that was a legit win because they even played them on the same map again. They pl played cash twice in two reasonably similar games. Now, in terms of those two cash games, because those were the two killers for me, because obviously Envy are the same team that smashed Dignitas on cash, mm -hmm. wrecked Nip on it at Gfinity only a week before. Now, this is a team where... Their T side approach on cash is so unique. They almost don't have any tactics, yet they are really good on it. And they just walk into the A site and shocks Kiyoshima. They just headshot people. It's unreal. Yeah. Like it shouldn't even work, but it works so much of the time. Now, the sad thing was in this game, I mean, sad if, if you wanted to see a, a really high level match, was on T side, Envy was really poor, actually. From what I remember, was in the best of three, Kiyoshima went really crazy, but everyone else was doing really badly. Everyone else on the whole team, Happy wasn't getting his kills he normally does. Shox was pretty much non existent. 
NBK yep. wasn't doing a whole lot. So here's the thing. Yeah, you give ultimate props go to... Come on, man. Mute, mute that mic. We can eat eating crisps, mate. <laughs> anyway, I hope that's, that's not, not on the stream, but I, but I can't handle that. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, our producer was literally just like eating some crisp Pringles or something. He went full full Pringles mode on us. Anyway, what I was what I was trying to say was, you have was to give the ultimate, rustling. The ultimate credit right. obviously goes over to Cloud9 because actually, unless Cloud9 did all the things they did, Envious still might have stolen some of these maps. They were still pretty good on CT sides. But you have to say, that wasn't at peak Envious, you know. It wasn't like beating someone where they're in top form and you just rise to their level and then out outmatch them, you know. Envious gave them a bit of a helping hand. But obviously, Cloud9 had to be there to take advantage of it. I, I want to talk about something in particular. Now, Shox was statistically uh, really poor uh, in this uh, best of three. Uh, finished behind Smith's um, overall uh, in sort of uh, kills to deaths, which is, I, I dread to think when the last time that happened was it. You, you probably have to go back really into the annals of history in the team. We were talking a lot about how Shox was coming back into this godlike form. A G Finity yep. we, and, and and beyond, and certainly online as well. He looked to be the player that we all know he can be. Not so much, especially on the uh, on the second day in this best of three. Now, one of the things that was talked about, and we all saw that video of this is how Shox warms up for a game, and he was like yeah. you know, virtually uh, asleep, uh, while of course Cloud Nine were there in their muscle vests, doing all their you know bro science with each other and all of that. Right now, Lurpis alluded to this in his uh, write up. Um, and this is something that, you know, we, we've seen it when we've been at events before. And he talked about how envious, you know, they do like to party. They don't leave it to the last night all the time. They do like to go out drinking. And several players that I spoke to who were at Cologne said envious did hit it pretty hard and were out pretty late the night before this uh, Cloud9 game. Um, now, is this a factor here in, in, in why they lost? And is this a factor in why Envious remain this inconsistent team? Because if you think about it, what happened to Gfinity, they lost the first map, I think, pretty much every best of three they played, it kind of felt yeah. like. I, I think uh, they're, they're very prone to losing the first map in, in, in series, especially if it's the first game of the day. So what are you? Yeah, well, the funny about? thing is, I'd never really looked at it as like a pattern. Like, yeah, I know that. The, here's the thing. I'd always thought of it as like, if they play badly, yeah, they can get upset by anyone because they have such an abusive playing style. Like they play off aim, so the aim's not there. Well, then also they're like the least respectful team in terms of buying. They never save. So they're going to like accelerate any of their problems and basically suicide themselves if they don't pit, turn it around. But I always just thought of that more in like the longer stretch of like, okay, they do that, say one in four times, but the rest of the time they're pretty middling and then they have the excellent games. So I thought of it as like a respect Spectrum. But actually, now he mentions it, when you actually look at the scheduling that these different games are all, it's always the first map of the, of the day. Well, if you remember, most most days, that's going to be, it's going to be usually before 12 o'clock at least. So yeah. that means you've got to have got to bed by, let's face it, minimum 3 a.m. in order to have gotten enough sleep, probably like more like 1 a.m. Mm. Now, the problem is, even when I go back and think in the past, okay, at the beginning of the year, an event they won at MLG, they lost the first game there to CLG on Dust 2. That was yep. the first game there. Now, now, I don't think in Aspen they necessarily were going out partying or whatever. But listen, this is actually a problem I've always thought historically no one ever brought up because it's kind of weird. Okay, it makes sense in the past where lands logistically had to run first game 9 a.m. and you have to finish whenever it finishes, you know, 12 a.m., whatever it is, right? So that makes sense that you have no choice. But it's always been weird if you think about it. If we're trying to put on tournaments to show off the world's best gamers... Why are we having games at 9 a.m.? I don't know any amazing gamer who's going to bed at 12 o'clock. So I'm not saying that that's not like an excuse. Is it? At this point in time, it is their job, and they only have to work about like like 10 weeks out of a year in actual lands or whatever. So get over it. But it is true. Even if you're not at a place where you can party or gamble or whatever, I could see people like the envious guys just staying up till 3 a.m. anyway because it's just their lifestyle, you know. So yeah. I think there's probably yeah. something to it because I can't think of any other team where this is the case because I think there's someone like Fnatic, and I'm sorry to say it if people if people think this 
that they're really cool guys. They're just super nerds, man. I could believe they are tucked in a bed at 11 p.m. Oh. Like it'd be like the fucking Waltons or something. Like good night, Crims. It's like night, Olaf. Just like <laughs> I, I can't do an accent in Swedish. That's the yeah, best. That I can it's do. pretty good. Yeah. I've always thought Flusher looked a bit like a redneck as well. But uh, yeah. I mean. I, you can't you can't picture those guys partying. Well, he he's the uh, he's the brother that they keep in the attic who was born of incest, <laughs> you know. And they just bring him down when the rest start fragging. They're like, "Win, carry a map, flesher, and you'll have a new bucket head, a bucket of fish heads." He's like, "Hey, hey. he looks like." He looks like a human version of that <laughs> fucked up Ewok that people always do the gifts of at Return of the Jedi. You know the ones they always imply is like after anal sex or something. That fucked up Ewok, like hey, has like the evil piercing eyes. That's wow. Flusher. Wow. I like the guy. I think he's funny, but yeah, I like that Ewok as well. He was pretty hardcore. Oh, See, Jesus. someone tell us the name of that Ewok if you know. Some super nerd out there knows. Wait, which one? I'll I probably just know this. It was, was it just wicked? the Ewok that had a little, like, uh, oh, sort of cloth thing around its head. That's Chief Chirper. Chief Could Chirper, be, I don't he's know called. Yeah, he's the medicine man, I believe. No, no, no. There's Chief Chirper's the chief. Yeah, well, who was the medicine man? Right, fuck it. Well, a Star Wars nerd will get on that. Right? Yeah, I'm disappointed in myself I didn't know that, <coughs> actually. A bit, bit disappointed. But anyway. But that's Flusher, yeah. <sighs> yeah, pretty pretty, pretty nice segue. Um, but yeah, anyway, back to back to Envious. Um, but, but I guess teams in general, you know, I do see a, a lot of these teams. Let, let's just be real, right? They don't live an athletic life. Like it's sure. not like you know, early to bed. The trainers there, okay, got to get up and have your macrobiotic diet at exactly ten a.m. and you know have all these. And we've talked about you know how th there are uh, dietitians and stuff are coming into like League of Legends, for example. Like that's now a thing that a lot of top teams want. They want to. They want to cook, a live-in cook that prepares meals for players and things like that. Uh, is this something that you think we actually need to get a bit tighter on in, in CSGO, or is it kind of one of the appeals of the sport, is that actually our, our athletes are pros. They, they are a little bit sort of, you know, we've got more George Bests, for example, than, say, a, a League of Legends has. I mean, the problem is, when you look at it, I mean, I mean, most of the upsets in this tournament, like the two upsets in the other group were the first games as well. The big problem is it probably doesn't lead to the best Counter-Strike. Like, these teams aren't playing their best on the first day. It's not just that they have the problems as well. It's that they also don't play that great in the match. So it's not that great for the spectator aspect. But I do think it probably, it, as more money comes in, it would be something worth doing. I don't know if every team would do it. That's the problem. Like, I get, I get the sense a team like Envious, even if you offered them that stuff, they want to live that lifestyle, you know. A lot of them have played for many, many years. Maybe someone like Shox wouldn't even bother playing anymore mm. if he literally had to buckle down and just go to bed every night and not go out drink. I mean, to someone like that, it, it might not be worth it, Bang. He is so talented, he can get away with going to a team that will let him do that, you know. So someone like him probably could be a George Best type guy where he'll get away with it no matter what. It's mm. probably more the guy like a Smith's where it's like, come on, mate, you're struggling anyway. You, you can't be out till 4 a.m. as well, you know. You're not James Dean. <laughs> So you, you need yeah. to go to bed and have your Weetabix, you know. Uh, I, I, again, I, maybe that's, that's the thing. It's like the team that parties together, yeah, it's great for the sort of personal bonding. But as you say, when you've got players at different levels, um, although, like you say, shocks look to be suffering this event as well. So yeah. they're, they're, it's not an exact science. That hangover was, was crippling. But let's talk about um, Cloud9 while we're here, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll get it out the way. We'll get it out the way. So they beat Envious in a best of one. And everyone's like, well, it's a best of one. And it was Cash. Cloud9's yeah. probably the map that they play the most. Um, although I am loath to use the term strongest map because they've had some dubious results on it in the past. We know Envious is strong on it, but it is still a best of one. Anything can happen. It can, the, the outcome of a best of one can come down to two pistol rounds, you know, or, or an eco or, or whatever. It, it, it can be that fine. That's why best of three is ultimately the, the format you should use, and no doubt we'll talk about that in a little while. But everybody in Europe, it seemed, was using the excuse, well, it's best of one. It doesn't really mean anything. Then they lose uh, to Virtus Pro. They lose a best of one to, to Virtus Pro. And you're like, right, normal service has been resumed. They've been wrecked on overpass. And then they do that best of three against Cloud9. Uh, straight maps, and fairly this, yeah. comprehensive. Then they do CLG. And then they get to the final, and at this point you think it's going to be a stomp for Fnatic, but actually it was a, it was a competitive game. Definitely, um, yeah. 
there were some incredible clutch moments from Cloud9. Like I got, I got to say, I thought, I thought people were perhaps going a little bit overboard, going, "Oh, Cloud9 was so unlucky. There were so many close rounds. Yeah. There were close rounds for Fnatic as well. Like yep. that really hinged on like one moment. Like they lost one round where I, I think it was might have been Sean Gares or someone. I don't know. No, Skrull actually just had a scout and was just getting shot in the back, and he just did some mad flick headshot, and that just got a kill, and it just completely ch- changed the round on its head. It's not like. All the luck went against Cl- you know Cloud Nine. No, definitely not. But uh, but it was it, but it was a competitive game. So my question to you, my NA hating friend, is: Do we need to reevaluate this Cloud Nine team on the back of this tournament, or do we say this is some sort of bizarre anomaly? And you know, normal service will be resumed soon enough. I I can't think of that it can be a, like an anomaly in the sense that. Okay, all the different things that had to happen, there was too many good results for it to be a total anomaly. Like, it's not like this will net, like nothing like this will ever happen again. If they don't just won the best of one, okay, now you, you're talking that. That could legit be an anomaly. Just like I don't think anyone expects CLG to be like beating a TSM if they play them again or a Fnatic. Well, it was Fnatic they beat, but it won't, no one's expecting them to do that again because they didn't do anything beyond that in the tournament. You know, they just beat Keed Stars and got wrecked by Cloud9. So. In terms of Cloud9, they not only got the best of one, they then cleanly won a best of three over Envious, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. utterly dumpstered their own competition, CLG, yeah. and then took Fnatic close. So there's there's like four different things happened there. So I, I have to say that's very impressive. With mm. that said, yeah, things could have gone a little bit differently. Like I, here's what's weird, okay. I tried to raise this point in my video about them, just to show people like a reasonable way that you don't have to take credit away from Cloud9, but just to show the tournament could have gone differently. So what I, my point I made was, think of Cloud9 and what they had to do. Now, if Cloud9 does exactly the same thing in the group stage, they win against Envious, they lose against Virtus Pro, then they beat Envious in the best of three. That nothing changes for them. I'm not taking any of their wins away. But all that happens in the other group is those two unlikely upsets, CLG beat Fnatic, Keyed beat T- TSM. Just make one of them not happen. Mm. Now, two, both had to happen. If even one of those doesn't happen, so TSM or Fnatic gets through, odds are TSM or Fnatic wins the group, and then Cloud9 has to play that team in the semis. And we all mm. know they'd obviously be a favorite to, to beat Cloud9 in a best of three. Even TSM would finish last place. They'd still be a favorite. So Cloud9 didn't, wouldn't have done anything differently, but then they would have just finished third to fourth. Now, they'd have still had a very good tournament. We'd be talking them up. Obviously, they wouldn't have gotten to play the, the big best of five, and it impresses even more. But I think that would be if you think that that could have happened in the same event with nothing else different happening well you'd obviously have to bring them down a little bit from the final you wouldn't have seen as much so you'd you'd have to kind of draw a line between the two i think like they did a really good performance some of it was a little bit of a performance they got their share of luck but there was obviously a basis there that you can't argue with that was impressive i agree with what you said actually i think that's a fair point that has to be made about the final though which is that people went way too far trying to sell that idea that like oh god aren't cloud nine unlucky Oh, you mean the same Cloud9 who won the first map, one that they are never in a million years supposed to win, 16-14 at that? Yeah. So there's one for you. Okay, they got that one. Now listen, everyone gets some luck. Then on Overpass, remember Overpass, the other another map, they lost. So they lost in a game, remember, they lost in a game in which Shroud and a bunch of them, when they were on CT, had miracle rounds. Shroud had that round mm. where he, like, I think they were on, it was after they lost the pistol, I think they were on the save, yeah, the, the, and yeah, Shroud yeah, killed, yeah, like, three yeah. people with a 5-7 or something. Yeah, then they had like a, yeah. Then they had, like, a 1v2 that they won in the site, and then they had a 1v1. Like, th- listen, Cloud9 got their share of luck. Now, listen, Fnatic got theirs. Like, that Dust2 round where it was match point, and Flusher oh. just, like, sprayed everyone down in that 2v7. That was utterly yeah. disgusting. That was absolutely insane. But if you add up all the luck, I might even gamble a chance that in the final, Cloud9 got a little bit extra of the luck. But I, I reckon, both teams I got reckon, a lot. I uh, reckon Flusher got a big bucket of fish heads for that one. Yeah, that was a ridiculous Definitely. round. So. Uh, but look, so here's the other question that I think was on everybody's lips as, as it was unfolding. There were, there were two maps... Uh, you know, in the final, where you could see, you could see, you know, it's certainly not. Uh, uh, I think it was the demolition job on Cash that uh, uh, Fnatic did, which Cloud9 were never at the races in that one. Uh, but um, certainly on Overpass and Dust Two, Cloud9 were ahead. They were in promising positions, uh, and certainly on Dust Two, this was absolutely true. They should have closed that map out. So the other question became, did they choke. Are they are they chokers? Did they choke in the final? Um, we saw that uh, Shroud, who went absolutely ham, 
he seemed to have a bit of animosity towards some of his teammates. It, t- towards the end, his body language was a little bit off. He he was like, you know, I've dropped thirty f- plus frags here. You know, like what have I? Yeah, what, yeah. You know, when when are you going to step it up? And I thought Freakazoid had a really good tournament if we look at it holistically. But I actually Definitely. do feel he was he was absent in the final a little bit. He didn't seem to be. You know, uh, his entry fragging was still there, but but actually it was his more sort of defensive play that really let him down. His CT sides seemed very poor indeed. And that was a factor on why they were Fnatic were able to come come back on Dust too. Um, now, but, but back to the question. Uh, did Cloud9 choke, or is this just Fnatic basically exerting their will, exerting their dominance? I think both happened, but it was on two different maps. On Overpass, if you remember, that was the one where basically Fnatic just closed the game out on CT side. Now, if you've mm-hmm. seen the way Fnatic's been playing Overpass recently, it was more of the same. They play this really interesting, aggressive style on the A site where they just push right out and they don't even let you set up to do a tactic onto the A site. Normally, a lot of the other teams play back in the site, just those default positions. So Fnatic just did this again, which they've done to a number of teams now. They did it at Gfinity uh, Spring Masters 2 against NIP in the game. That was like an overtime game there, I think. They've done this style again and again. And the problem there was this style was so effective that that was the only half I saw in the whole tournament where Cloud9 couldn't really do a whole lot on T-side. Like they were just, they didn't have any ideas of what to do. They had nothing left. So so on that one, I don't blame Cloud9. Like in general, I think they still took the right approach. Fnatic just played a very good CT half. So that one wasn't their fault. Fnatic really took it to them that one. Dust2 is the one that, yeah, Cloud9 should have won. It was really in their hands to win. Like Fnatic... Yeah, Fnatic found a strategy that worked. They just kept splitting to B over and over and over and over again. But this time, Cloud9 is on the CT side. If they even just cut that off once, they win the whole game because they were at something like 15 to 9. So I do think that on the Dust 2 game, it's not that they entirely choked. Like I think at the beginning, it was more like they just didn't know what to do. But then you saw as the game went later, it was almost like no one... Like, put it this way, the stars who were still fragging Shroud, Skadoodle, none of them ever, like, play made and did, like, a crazy round or, or put themselves in a situation where they could get in on the other opponent and take an, It's like they all just sat in their spots and just hoped that they were just going to get the kills and win the round, and obviously that didn't happen. Now, yeah. yeah, it takes a world-class team to be able to still be able to do that to you every round, but I think that one was more on Cloud9. Like, if if I forget all the other maps and I look only at Dust2, yeah, we probably should have been going to a fifth map. Yeah, I agree with you. I, 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 I thought that was how it was going to go, actually. And I think Fnatic would have run a train uh, over Cloud9 on Inferno. Uh, run yeah, a train over, been nasty, not, run a, not run a train on. Uh, just, just Definitely over. not. No, no, I don't think been. you could forcibly run a train on a guy like Freakazoid unless he was into it. You know? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how can you not? Of course, absolutely. You're you're right. You're right once again, but um, yeah, it, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been pleasant. I don't think the the Inferno game. I think they would have comprehensively won that one. But of course, had it gone to a fifth map, not only yeah, anything can happen, but it does add validity to the idea that Cloud Nine, you know, have gone through this transformation and are uh, an inter, an international team to be taken very seriously. Because obviously, how many you know you might get you might get teams that take one map off Fnatic, um, although like that they're pretty limited but certainly to take two maps off fanatic now you're in tsm territory so uh, you know that would have been very good for them indeed um just while we're talking about the uh sort of final as a whole uh cloud nine getting there and putting in a, a reasonably strong performance against fanatic what does that do for you in terms of their ranking is i know you don't like to fluctuate too much based on one event but this is a significant event and it was a significant yeah, yeah. performance by by a team that have been kind of flirting uh, with with that sort of you know climbing up that top ten for a while now. So do you do you rate them any higher after this? I mean, I haven't I haven't exactly figured out where I'm going to put them yet, but they'll definitely be in the top ten. I mean, that's pretty sure because you have to realize the two teams who were at the bottom of my top ten, I think was, I think it was Hellraisers and Flipsider, like the ninth and tenth. So I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I probably would even bump them past both of those. Like maybe they'll be in ninth ninth place. It'd be like between them and uh, Dignitas, I think, for like ninth, eighth and ninth. Because, I mean, listen, at this event, yeah, you finished second at an event that did have VP, TSM, even if you didn't have to play them. And you won a best of three over Envious in an impressive fashion. So those factors combined, yeah, that's very good. And unfortunately, the teams at the bottom below you, Obviously, they haven't done anything comparable to that. Some of them have placings, but they haven't won like a big best of three over Envious, you know. So I think, yeah, they're probably going to immediately be in in the, in the top 10 again. But 
obviously we're not going to go crazy off one event. Mm. Like, like for example, I can't really credit you. Like in terms of world rankings, you can't be credited for a loss. Doesn't matter how awesome the loss is. Like I can't yeah, be like, true, oh, they were so true. close to being Fnatic. Like that doesn't work in standings, does it? You know? <laughs> no. Um, so, uh, here's something I definitely want to do because, uh, I don't want to make the same mistake that ESL did and just skirt over Fnatic. <laughs> like, like pretty much all of their post-match discussion was, oh, Cloud9, Cloud9, look at their vests, look, <laughs> look at Freakazoid's natural muscular structure, look at, uh, everything that NA have achieved and yeah, Fnatic yeah. are pretty good. There's JW with the trophy. See you next time. See ya, see ya. It was really fucking skewed in you know towards the americans and you know i i maybe understand it from a broadcast perspective because obviously you want to uh you know the the na market's growing for csgo it's not as you know sort of uh what's the word as as, as rigid as you know as in place as the european market but ultimately it did feel like the people who won the tournament kind of just got fucking ignored which was a little bit, you know, like, it was like, yep, you've done it again, guys. You're a great team. Dynastic, they're really boring, though. We want to talk about Cloud9, yeah, yeah. you know, like, just, it was like, kind of did feel a bit like that. So let's talk about Fnatic. Um, I, I didn't think they looked like vintage Fnatic here. I thought there were some key members that were, you know, underperforming a bit. I think it speaks volumes. Like, as you said, our, our friend Flusher Fishhead was, uh, you know, top fragging. On a lot of maps, I mean, apart from Olaf Meister, who was just wrecking fools on cash. That was one of the best individual performances I've well, seen. Well, the funny thing is that that was pretty much the only map he went ham on, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, actually, yeah. on the Cobblestone game, they barely lost. Again, he did almost nothing. What, is that the norm? Is that the norm, is it, guys? Oh, I guess, I mean, I'm surprised people didn't go further with kind of like the the theories. Like, oh, I guess Cloud9 is the first team to come up with the system to shut Olaf Meister down. You know, like, yeah, if you're going to no. be idiots, just go hog wild with it, you know? Well, um, you know, so Olaf Meister was actually a bit subdued this tournament. In a way, though, it was. It, it, this is what great teams do. This is one of the things that we talk about that doesn't happen uh, in other teams. You know, when they're dysfunctional, they fail. When Fnatic are dysfunctional, people step up. Crims, I thought, was back to his consistent, uh, you know, standards. But JW as well was going ham, no pun intended. Uh, and, you know, I... I, I, I God, really? I thought, yeah, yeah, really. I thought overall, I thought overall, uh, you know, that, that JW and Flusher were the standouts in this particular final. But uh, he, he was he, pra practically sizzling the way he you went could ham say there, that, Wait, he brought home the bacon in that tournament. There's no doubt about it. So um, <laughs> that's where it belongs. Uh, yeah, let's let's go, it, mate. We can we can do this all night. But um, basically, what I, what 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 I do want to say is that Olaf Meister, the best player in the world. Fairly quiet tournament for him. Fnatic's yeah. still good enough to win it and, 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 and win it ultimately, I guess, if we look at it on paper, in a fairly convincing and comprehensive fashion. So uh, are we now, what, what do we learn about Fnatic from this particular tournament? That's the thing. I think we really did learn something here. Like I'd made a tweet after the final of like how the star combos had changed over the months in Fnatic. And the difference was I generally meant in the past, it was sort of like three month spans where they sw swapped. That in itself is amazing that you can swap. Like one guy can have three months where he's just average and then another guy has three months where he goes ham. But yeah. the thing is, for this particular tournament, yeah, literally their best player of the last three months just went like flatlined almost to a degree. Like he wasn't terrible. I mean, he's so good. He's not going to like minus frag or whatever in games, but yeah. he was just okay. Like, he actually made them quite mortal. But then, Flusher just goes completely ham for two maps. One of them, he pretty much almost single-handedly won the overpass game. So, yeah, that says something about how good you are as a team when, like, your third or fourth best player can be the best player in the entire server in a best-of-five final. I mean, funnily enough, what you were saying before, which is accurate about the way the, the broadcast of the show kind of made it, like... Like, typically, you'd start with the winners. You'd be like, and our champions, here's what they did right. And at the end, you'd be like, and of course, we want to give, like, a, a, some props to the people who came second. You know, they fought through. And then you'd talk about them. They almost never talked about it, except at the end, they were sort of like, oh, yeah, and Fnatic's a great team, aren't they? But if anything, that speaks to, like, what a legendary team this is. For most teams... To win an event is a massive event, is a massive occasion where you'd obviously be bigging up this team that won and wow, what incredible fashion. They played the games of their lives. That's the thing. Fnatic didn't play the games of their lives. This was just like a Sunday for them. Yeah. And it was so mundane that people just thought, well, of course, you know, Fnatic ended up winning it overall with like their C game. So 
that just, in a weird way, the lack of attention just shows that it's so expected that this team just wins in almost all circumstances. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, it, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's kind of that, uh, you know, it, it is indicative of a truly great team. It's like the Yankees, you know, winning a World Series again. You know, it's like, you know, uh, Lakers taking home another title. Obviously, that doesn't happen quite so much now, showing show my age a little bit there. But, you know, it, when you get these dynastic teams, it almost does become routine. Manchester United winning the Premier League title. You can almost hear the boredom, you know, often in the pundits' voices, and they've done it again. You know, it, it's people do crave that underdog status, and people do crave great teams being dethroned. But it's got to, it's got to be said that shouldn't ultimately detract from a coverage perspective of the no. achievement itself, uh, which which <coughs> I thought it did a little bit in the ESL uh, broadcast. But using that as a follow-on. The team that you can usually back to make Fnatic's life very hard indeed is TSM. Now, I didn't share your sentiments last week that, that TSM were capable of, of, of winning the tournament. I, I think um, that th- right now, with the, the, their complete lack of practice, I think had there been an option to sort of not attend and have maybe the fifth place team go, I, I think TSM might have actioned that. But um, that was, it was made abundantly clear that's not an option, not for this league. Uh, there's no chances of dropping, not if you want to compete in it again next season. This is gonna, those days are over. So I think TSM, not strong-armed a little bit, you know, but, but they, they went there nowhere near their level. Uh, I don't think they put any practice in. And it showed, you know, they got caught out by Keed Stars on Inferno, a map that's Usually very good for TSM. You know, they've had some good results on there. You know, not, the, not their best map, but, but a map that you can usually rely on them to, to do some pretty spectacular things and be competitive with. You know, Keatstar, Shua, they uh, have done their homework. They're a very good tactical team. But because TSM haven't sort of played any tournaments since the last frag bite, I think it is, and, and, and you know they're not practicing. Everyone in the scene knows that. You have just got, like demos you can just go to and just anti-strap them. Now, I'm not saying Keed Stars did that, but it's an option. You, you could definitely have done that with TSM. So then, they, I mean, they were they were mortified at that loss. And then they play Fnatic, best of one. Great game, actually. One of the, yeah, yeah. just in terms of the drama around it, how close it was, probably is one of the best games in the whole tournament between the top two teams, arguably, in the world. 16-14, Fnatic. Uh, TSM competitive, but you could see they were just doing it on raw aim, raw ability, you know, Cajun bees going off. Everybody's sort of trying to step up and just drag them across the finish line. At that point, it's got to be said, Fnatic would have been out. Uh, so, I mean, that, that in itself would have been unthinkable. It, it, it was a great first day for sort of upsets. But when TSM went out, I mean, you could see they were aghast. They were really emotional. Couldn't believe it. Um, you know, the, the camera was on them. The players, you could see they were clearly emotional about it all. But um, I, I, I don't think we should... I, I'm not going to read anything into this because, like I say, I, T- TSM have got educational stuff going on. They've got their exams going on. I, I still think that team is going to be right up there when they get back to being able to train practice. Um, what do you think? I mean, do you think this is like... like how long can you realistically take off and still maintain the level that TSM were at, I guess, is the question. Well, the problem is it could have worked in as much as what they had was good. Like their approach was very good. But then basically you can't afford for anyone to have an off game because essentially the things you're doing are known. You have to execute at this point. You're not going to have any, there's not, not going to be any tricks or new things, new little wrinkles you've put in. So you saw in that game against Fnatic particularly the game against Keith Stars, some of them weren't really individually on that much, but Keith Stars clearly had done their homework and they had like, they probably did anti strap them to be fair, but but fair play, that's what you're supposed to do if you're the underdog Absolutely. team and if you're the less skilled team. So that's fair enough. The problem is, first of all, I feel a bit, I, I feel actually a bit sorry for TSM because they're, when they lose to Keith Stars, that's one thing to get upset, but then you're, you have to then beat Fnatic in a best of one just to get into the winner's yeah. match, into the final match of the group. Never mind even get out of the group. So I can't really blame them for losing to Fnatic on one map in what was obviously a great map. But on the map against Fnatic, it kind of showed that even skill-wise, some of them weren't there. Because, yeah, Cajun B had like 36 kills. Yeah. But everyone else was like hanging around like 15 kills. And then the problem is, 
even the 36, now in a normal circumstances, 36 kills from Kejin B with everyone else on plus 10, that's enough. You still win the map. But then Olaf didn't get quite that far, but he was like 30 kills as well. So, yeah, I mean, that, that was that that was a tall ask to ask them to win that best of one under the circumstances you're describing here, because I'm pretty sure every other time they'd played Fnatic in these big series, yeah, that was coming into situations where Fnatic's attending every tournament, they're attending the ones that they choose to attend, and they're getting a little bit of time to figure things out and to change things and to hone in on Fnatic, you know. So, yeah, I, here's the thing. Obviously, before the tournament, people could read the other way and be like, oh, TSM's the new great team, they'll win every tournament. As I, in the same sense that I wouldn't have gone that far, I wouldn't go the other way and be like, oh, it's over for them. Like, yeah, they're, they're, it turns out that was only like three months or something. I think this was just, uh, they lost one best of one to me, basically. The one they lost to Fnatic, I don't even really count that. Like, that that could have happened. And they could have won that as well, remember. In fact, here's a crazy thought for you. Because they weren't in the greatest form, if they'd have beaten Fnatic in that match, I'm pretty sure they do win the best of three over Keed in the decider, right? But that then means that they would have come out second, and so they would have played Virtus Pro in the semis. Now, that's a fucking great match right there. And that's a match yeah, Virtus yeah, yeah. Pro might be able to win. So actually, sadly for Virtus Pro, that one match between TSM and Fnatic might have cost Virtus Pro the title. Because the way Virtus Pro was playing, actually, I think they maybe win the tournament if they get to play TSM there. Mm. Um, I mean, as it happens at the moment, just what this is live simultaneously with this broadcast. Okay. Uh, apparently, Virtus Pro are smashing uh, TSM in the uh, Face It League uh, stage two. Uh, on on dust two currently in a best of one. So um, just uh, I, you know, I I I I don't. I'm not. I, I don't think. I, I agree with you. I don't think we we start writing off TSM. But it is interesting because, like you say, you know, there's a team like Fnatic. They're in their groove. They win a major. They take a holiday quite smartly. Don't attend some of the lesser tournaments. Recharge their batteries. Come back. But they didn't leave it too long. You know, they they left it like three, four weeks, something like that, and then it's back to business, and they continue to be absolutely, absolute ownage. Uh, but, you know, can TSM do the same? I would say that's like quite a, that's quite a unique attribute to be able to have. Generally, teams seem to do well once they find this groove, this consistency, and it's almost like you never want it to end. You know, you, you want to be at tournaments every weekend because it keeps you sharp, you know, where you need to be to be competitive. And, uh, you know, I, I do have a little bit of, um, a little, a little slight fear that for the next month or two, TSM are going to be susceptible to being beat. I mean, first of all, as I said, it's not like other teams where it's like they've been going to other tournaments, <clears throat> trying out new tactics, reinventing themselves. You've now got to decide, well, are they going to play like they played at this tournament? Are they going to play like this one? You can just go back and just get the last time TSM played. You know they're not going to have changed anything, and you know they're, they're now vulnerable to anti -strang. Um Equally... You, you know, when you play them, Carrigan's, again, who's he, what's he going to do? Try and come up with some tactics on the fly? Probably smart enough to do it, but ultimately you're going to face some pretty default strategies, I would imagine. So, uh, yeah, I, I think for the next few weeks, uh, and, and possibly months, actually, I think TSM are going to have these inconsistent results. I don't know if you could sort of back them to to be... I've got, I've got a crazy people. question for you here that no one's yeah. actually brought up okay. So I'd right. heard the same thing, that TSM themselves were even sort of saying, like, oh, listen, we're probably not going to be in the best form. Like, oh, you know, we couldn't practice much, etc. Remember, this tournament, technically, if you're a top team, gave you a chance to win more money than the major because second place is actually yeah. 60K at this tournament instead of the 50K. And obviously, the first place is 100, just like a major. So in yeah. theory, even with three majors in a year, there's only going to be something like, are there going to be two of these in a year? So that'd make like five total chances to win 100,000. Mm. Don't you find it, find it kind of crazy that one of the best teams in the world takes the month off? entirely before a tournament where 100k for first place meanwhile they're going hell for leather for tournaments where you win like 20k first place there's something a bit weird about that right what does that say about the tournament yeah yeah no i i, I definitely uh definitely agree with uh with you on that front but i i think it's more just timing I, I don't think it's any part of a grand strategy first of all i know enough about the management infrastructure of tsm to know that uh Reg Reginald uh, and, and, and the management team there, they're not like a typical organization. Like, for example, there are organizations out there, and again, I don't want to you know, drop some truth bombs on fans, but this is just the reality. There are a lot of organizations out there that don't want excellence. Excellence is not implied with the sponsorship. What they care about is market reach, social uh, media presence, 
They care about you, you know, going to tournaments and yeah, having a good showing, not getting too much criticism. But you know, as long as you hit roughly what your level's supposed to be, many organisations will just sit back and be like, yeah, I'm not going to change a team. Why would I change a team? We, we, look at look, we, look at all the sponsorships we're bringing in. Look at all this. excellence isn't always implied. When I was a manager. Uh, it was the exact same for me. We used to be sponsored by a company called Ceratec. They made uh, the Z board keyboards, which I'm sure a lot of World of Warcraft players will, will in particular remember. That was a very popular brand for them. And when we had our sponsor talks, I said to them, like, you know, do do we what 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 are your expectations? And they literally told us, here's your sponsorship money. Go to tournaments. We know you're going to be able to just get to a certain level anyway, based on the talent you have. But go out, drink every night. Take photos of it, upload it to the blog, have a good time, make Counter Strike look as rock and roll as possible, and just name drop sponsors and do a blog. That was it. That we, 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 at no point did a sponsor say, "Hey, win the tournament." They didn't give a fuck. It was just about exposure. So TSM are actually a little bit different uh, to, to that sort of uh, outlook that's been my experience. Like Reginald wants to win everything. He wants TSM to be number one. If anything, they're under a, a unique kind of pressure that I think other teams aren't. Um, although, you know, they've been supported quite well and their ascent to being a top team has been dr quite dramatic since uh, they left uh, Team Dignitas. But I, I definitely think that the reason they go hell for leather in these lesser tournaments is it, it, they want to win them. They want to rack up as many title wins as possible. They want to be able to say, hey, we're an elite level team. You know, they'll be gunning for the number one spot. They're going to want to dethrone Fnatic, not in one tournament. But long term as a dynastic team, and that will be the aim for TSM. You know, you've seen how Reginald's run the League of Legends team. Nobody's safe. <laughs> you know, I mean, not, not even Dyrus, maybe. It, 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 he, he, he's removed, he removed like the odd one when he was still one of the most popular streamers on Twitch. Because it was time well, It for is a also worth pointing out as well that, I mean, I realize they've teased us with this for months and months now, but TSM has claimed repeatedly that as soon as this school year ends, which must be like now, basically, that yeah. after this, they're all free, I think, after this to just play like proper full-time pros. Now, yeah. unfortunately, they've been telling us that for ages and everyone's been telling them, why don't you just take the year off like last year, et cetera. But if that's true, then that that in itself maybe turns things around, like opens things up a little more. I'm never quite sure on that one, though. You, you have to see how that plays out, really. Mm. So yeah, but I, but I, I definitely I definitely agree with you. Uh, this is uh, you know it's an interesting time for TSM because they're gonna have to come back, like you say. You know they're gonna want to be at this major. They're gonna want to do well. They're gonna want to be like a, a finalist ultimately. And then you know we we talk about Fnatic and how TSM have been their kryptonite quite famously, even even without practice, sixteen fourteen game in a best of one. They, you know they're not gonna want to take. To much more time off. They need to start getting back to, to being capable of what they're doing. Um, and, I, and again, I, I think it was evident from the emotion that the players showed when they went out that actually they're very cognizant of the fact that, that what happened at this event isn't good enough even for a TSM that isn't practicing right now and has been focusing on um, health issues for, for device and and on top of that exams as well so but anyway we'll move we'll move away from tsm i'm i'm confident they're going to bounce back but i think they're going to be vulnerable for the foreseeable let's talk uh just about a couple of other teams here uh clg uh made it to the semi-finals uh of course but i think that is a bit of a sort of a disingenuous representation of how they played overall because they got yeah. there by winning two best of ones which to me, and I, I said this on uh, another broadcast uh, earlier in the week, if your format allows a team to get to the semi-final of a major tournament of this size by winning two best of ones, your format is broken. Uh, and and yeah. end of story. You cannot you cannot defend that. While other teams have had to have this attritional slog to get to the same stage, and and a, t a team wins two best of ones and they're there, that is not acceptable. Um, and, 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 and it should never be emulated again. I don't care about the arguments about logistical reasons or time constraints or whatever. That cannot be allowed to happen. Not, it's, it's bad for the sport. And End of discussion. There's no positive argument that can be made for it. But anyway, to, to assess the results, of course, one of those results was a ridiculous upset on Fnatic. I think that's when I messaged you, actually, and went, here we fucking go. This is like, <laughs> next week on, on By the Numbers is going to be awesome. I couldn't believe that. So 16-12 on Mirage for, for, for CLG. Then, of course, they beat Keed on, on Cash. 
and you know they got wrecked by cloud nine so what do we really know about clg here like sure a win against Fnatic, best of one i guess that's good beating keyed stars yeah. that's the, that's them actually punching above their weight if we look at the regular season for the north american side clg shouldn't even have been there clg only got in by virtue of nihil and hiko's team just plummeting down the rankings and just having a collapse that was unprecedented, losing six in a row. So CLG shouldn't even been here. They beat Keith Stars, who finished second in the regular season. That's punching above their weight and then weren't able to do anything against Cloud9. Do we give CLG a newfound respect or, or are they the North American anomaly? I mean, the thing is, the best of one over Fnatic... Listen, if you ever even use terms like, is it legit, is it a fluke, people always just get super butthurt. Obviously, yeah. most of these best of one upsets are flukes, like Keed beating TSM is a fluke, CLG beating Fnatic is a fluke. Maybe you can say the Envy one wasn't because the Envy Cloud9 one, like they actually were only close because they lost both the pistol. Like there was the other circumstances that made it look closer than it was. The thing is, it was clear to me that the guys from CLG had, had obviously studied Fnatic, on that map especially. But you also have to throw in that someone, I remember someone mentioning this, supposedly on the comms for Fnatic, they just literally were saying stuff like, hey, let's just scrim these guys. Like, as in, let's just like fuck around and we'll just wreck them with aim, essentially. So if you combine those two factors together, yeah, it makes sense that they could win. I mean, yeah, they obviously played a, a good game as well. The problem after that is when they then go against Keed Stars, I've never thought Keed Stars had that many good players anyway. To me, the fur guy is good and the rest of them are just average players, even for NA players. So to me, they, they're not that skilled a team anyway. So I could believe CLG can outskill out Keed in one best of one. That's not, that's not even much of an upset or a, or, a, yeah. or a big win, you know. So the problem there is essentially they did one really good map at the tournament. Then they got so smashed by Cloud9 as to make it almost irrelevant anyway. So at that point, you just kind of felt like, who gives a fuck about CLG? Like at that point, I was waiting for the other semifinal, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I knew Cloud9 were going to win that, that game. It just, it just seemed like a bridge too far. And I think they would have been found out on a best of three against almost any other team there, uh, which isn't to, to try and be disparaging about them. But the, this from, they, for me, were the weakest team in attendance, even though they made it to the semifinals. I mean, just on paper... I'm not talking about performances, you know, ridiculous performance against Fnatic. I mean, that's yeah. uh, that, that that's a result to talk about for for, for some time. Um, and like you say that, you know, I, I think there was a little bit of YOLO uh, about it because they shouldn't have even been at the tournament. And, um, you know, that gives you a lift. You think, well, you know, we shouldn't even have been here. What else can we achieve? Mentally, you've already got that extra percentage that it gives you. But, um, yeah, I didn't I, di I didn't really think the the hype was kind of warranted. Like, that day one, yeah, it did look like that every European fan was just in hell. Like, we'd all simultaneously died and been transported to the nether realm, where Satan, who, of course, is George Bush, was just there, just jerking off and spewing NA results in all our faces from the end of his scaly dick. It was horrible. It was horrible. Unfortunately, I'm not biased in that way. Well, here's so the funny wasn't. thing. If you remember what I did with the Cloud9 example of they could have played, like, obviously they could have played TSM, they could have played Fnatic in the semis if those teams had won their group. Go the other way. Remember, Cloud9 winning that group meant that, in theory, CLG had gotten the best possible result for them in a semi. That should have given them a chance to go to the final. They're playing a team from their region that they know very well, that, in theory, is not some team who's going to have, like... Well, it's not going to be some team like Envy or VP who's going to mega outskill you and give you no chance whatsoever if they're on their A game, you know? So you've gotten the best possible chance. Now, here's where actually it helps the whole region if this is an awesome best of three that goes three maps and it's so close back and forwards and both teams show incredible level and then everyone's like, wow, the whole NA region's awesome. And then all those fans who were like, remember the same fans who after the best of one from Cloud9 were like, I told you, NA is a lot better than you thought. They weren't the ones who were like, oh, but we admit CLGs was a fluke. They were like, no, no, the whole region's better. You guys talk shit. Well, it's like, well, <laughs> then Cloud9 utterly shit on CLG. So if anything, Cloud9 looked like European team. CLG still looks like an NA team. So unfortunately, I think that made it even worse that even yeah. the NA team ultra dumpstered them. I mean, if I think of it the other way, if Envy makes it past Cloud9, I'm pretty sure Envy just does the same thing to CLG there. As much as CLG might hate on that, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what else is brilliant, right? Like, all right, okay. North American people, as a people, have been hating on Brazilians 
for how long, right? Like, <laughs> how long has that been a fucking feature of the internet? We've all time. seen it, like, bia bia, give money, please. Hui, 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 hui. We've all seen yeah. the memes. They're on the internet. Google them. Uh, the amount of times I've talked to, like, American guys, and they're like, why can't we just put Brazilian people on their own server so they stop ruining our games? They are like to to the North American scene what Russians are to the European scene. They're they're in a close proximity, but they're culturally different enough for, for us to have issues when it comes to playing online games, right? Now, uh, again, not a view I subscribe to. I know many Brazilian players. I used to help out the Brazilians when they were coming over to European events and stuff. So I, again, I am exempt from criticism. I am just making observations. But here we go. For one day, for one glorious day only, right? Keen Stars were an NA team. South America didn't exist anymore, Duncan. It didn't exist. They're uh, Americans. Here's your visas. You're with us now. You're beating Europeans. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck? Like, they just became, like, like some Orwellian 1984. They just became a super state. It was North America and Brazil. North American teams are beating everyone. They're South American, you fucks. I mean, I know Americans are bad at geography as a fucking rule. But come on, that... Brazil, Brazil isn't North America. It never has been. You're really reaching here. And then, of course, they go out the tournament, right, to CLG, I think. Oh, sorry, obviously to uh, Fnatic. But they, when they lost to CLG, it was already turning, right? The same people who've been saying Keen Stars were North American when they were getting wrecked by CLG. It was like, yeah, USA, fuck you, Brazil. And then when Fnatic beat them, they were like, yeah, get home. You're stinking up the joint. And they all went and supported Cloud9. I mean, come on, guys. We've got to be better than that as fans. The thing is, though, that that whole mess of people... Not, it's not even that... They, it's one thing if they'd just been very clear with the semantics and they were like, okay, technically, Keith Stars is representing the North American division. No one has any argument with that. But instead, they were like, NA teams are wrecking you guys. It's like, fuck you. That's not what it means. <laughs> but here's the saddest part, Rich. Because of the ESEA, ESL Pro League, I'm pretty sure that's why Cloud9 and all those NA teams no longer are talking about maybe we'll go and stay in Europe for a few months because I wish that was still a possibility because imagine NA fans may I'd go and screenshot them all just to fuck with them <laughs> saying like oh Brazil Keith Stars is an NA team imagine this Rich imagine if then Cloud9 came to Europe for like two months and got way better I'd just be like ah, another good European team you NA teams are pretty shit right They'd be like, what, what are you talking about I'd be like pull up the screenshots just <laughs> yeah. like there we go they're Europeans now representing European region yeah, that would be too sweet wouldn't it Oh, yeah. I'd love to appropriate NA's best team just because, like... Why not? Yeah, why the fuck not, mate? What's good for the goose has got to be good for the gander. That's that's the rule. Um, so, look, we'll wrap up our uh, ESL, ESEA Pro League. Again, I'm not even going to do the fucking abbreviation for it. Cause what was it like? You know, it's, it's just ridiculous. ESL, ESEA, PL or something. Like, you yeah, fuck off. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just... Find a better name. Like, get, I just get, think EEL... I, EEL. Why not yeah, just do that? Yeah, eel. Yeah, that would have been good. Uh, more fish heads for Flusher. But let's uh, let's talk about all the problems that the uh, that the event had, right? Uh, because for me, there were multiple ones that just weren't acceptable. So we've already talked about format. Now you're a, you're a guy who loves to talk about this. You've, you you know you're a guy who's been pushing for better structure in tournaments for years. For as long as I've known you. It, one of your pet peeves has been like when formats just basically hinder actually being able to make true assessments about who's the better team because yeah. format is inconsistent. So I'll, I'll just get your views on that before we go into all the other shit. I mean, to me, the obvious format is is best of three. Now, obviously, people are going to be like, you just said that because you work with Gfinity. Well, that's because up close, I've seen what best of three is like from the Gfinity events that had best of three. And I've noticed in best of three GSL style, I've never actually seen a team complain. As in, I've heard fans who don't understand how double elimination works complain like, but we played the same team twice. The first time we beat them, the second time we lost, shouldn't that we won one? People who don't understand that sort of thing complain, okay. I've never heard a team, though, go out in GSL best of three and be like, oh, we were much better than the team who beat us. The system's bullshit. We didn't feel like we yep. got a fair crack. I've never actually seen that happen. So I think I think it fulfills the, the spectator needs, the team needs. I will admit, logistically, it's a lot more strenuous. It means that you have to basically run the tunnel all day long. But, I mean, I'd rather just find a way to make that work because it just seems like it's such a good format. 
And here's the thing. If you win a best of three, like think about when Mouse Sports twice beat Virtus Pro at the last Gfinity. Yeah. Who was saying, oh, Mouse Sports, that was a fluke. Well, if that had been two best of ones or just one best of one and then in a round robin format, anyone could have been saying it's a fluke. And I wouldn't, it'd be hard to defend against them, you know. But mm. winning two best of threes over Virtus Pro? No, they schooled Virtus Pro there. They comprehensively beat Virtus Pro in impressive fashion. So it takes away a lot of the problems, I think, and gives you more information. Mm. Um, I mean, again, do you, ESL, they did put up a Reddit thread, I think, which was like they were talking about, oh, it's logistics and time constraints. Yeah. Surely now one of the good things finally about the development of CSGO is actually people are doing tournaments now uh, quite regularly. And as a result of that, you know, even events that are new to it, like Gfinity, which we worked at, we did that one in the copper box, which was really poor. I think we can agree in, t in terms of what it delivered and its delays and everything. And then the next one was still bad in terms of delays, but better. They improved. The one we just worked at, I don't think there was a single delay that wasn't, you know, player caused. Yeah, yeah. I think everything from a technical aspect was great. So ESL are the industry leader here. Surely words like time constraints and logistics shouldn't mean anything when it comes to format. If, if newcomers can get best of threes on day one, why can't why can't they? You well, know, especially because I always thought. I even made this point when I did a video about it. Like, to be fair to an event like DreamHack, for example, it's one thing if you're like Gfinity and you own the venue. Now, you can decide how many days it takes place. You can build a booth in it and not have to rebuild it, and it costs it's a one-off cost, you know? You get a lot of advantages. Okay, I'm giving someone like DreamHack a, a, a pass there because they have to hold their event at a different event. Now, even if it's DreamHack... That, that line only lasts a few days. Or if it's a, a foreign country, maybe they only have the venue for two days. Mm. Remember, what, one, th one factor I hadn't considered is this took place in the ESL studio. Now, for yeah. anyone who thinks that sounds fancy, let me just pop that bubble for you. The ESL studio is the bottom floor of the ESL offices. They just took some offices, moved all the shit out, and made it into a studio. That's why the camera angle is one crowd shot that shows about 50 people. That's not like a cross-section. That's the crowd. Now, here's the problem. Do you think that they have to pay for their own fucking office space? No, they can have that. They could have had the whole thing over a whole week if they'd wanted. Now, will it cost more in terms of teams putting people up in hotels? First place is $100,000. I don't think any team gives a flying fuck about one extra day. No one's going to be like, oh, I'm canceling. Yep. Uh, kind of. And I'm, I mean, I don't know about this, but I'm assuming for this tournament, do they actually pay your costs to fly there from the league? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. Do they? Maybe. It probably do, actually. Probably, yeah. So yeah. It, it really, we're not talking about that much more logistically. Like Again, I'd, I'd give them a lot more room if it was like they had a venue locked down for two days and you've got to get it done there. That's one thing. Unfortunately, the guy, who, the flying DJ guy, made the classic mistake of, of, it's like a classic riot type mistake, where not only do you say, like, listen, we fucked up, and everyone's like, oh, okay, well, that's fair enough. But here's the justifications and excuses to why. And everyone's like, those don't fly. Those don't work on any level. So like saying stuff like, you know, we didn't, we wanted to have like a lot of time for coverage sites to do it and all that stuff. Okay. So why are you wasting our time with like fucking show matches and stuff? Like, well, what's, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't all add up, you know, basically. That's yeah, the problem yeah, I thought yeah. for them. Well, I mean, and of course, show matches that then didn't, that were announced and then didn't go ahead uh, because of technical problems. So anyway... We'll, we'll move I mean, away. one extra day, I think, could have could have easily solved a lot of these problems. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. One problem it wouldn't have solved, yeah. proximity of playing desks. Now, obviously, soundproof booths, you recently did a video on this. I watched it. Um, I've come around to soundproof booths, actually, because uh, I've seen them done right. I'd always seen them done in a way where it was literally just some sort of giant box, uh, yeah. which really felt to kind of... You know, with just people playing inside, obviously there's still giant boxes, but I mean, literally there's no like monitors or anything. Like when they first come in, they were just literally designed to insulate sound. That was all they did. Um, and I always felt that ruined the spectator experience because it was like you were just, you weren't connected with them in a way you can be crowds cheering. I used to make the analogy of like when you play fo a football match at home, you do have an advantage because the crowd cheers and goes man on. And if, if it's good enough for mainstream sports, then it's good enough for, for CS. But since then, 
I've come round to soundproof booths. I think the ones we've got now, like again, to use Gfinity as an example, there's 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 the ones they have there where it's like you know the, the first ones they had were, were, were crap and too small because they were just Call of Duty ones that they'd modified. But now with the monitors there, individual player cams, you know, so you can see reactions. They're really visible. Um, crowds seem to dig it. You know, no one's complained about it. They the, the players can't hear anything, so it preserves the integrity of the tournament. Great stuff. Here at ESL, obviously you can't have soundproof booths. And probably it's with a heat wave in Germany, it's just as well. Or all the teams apart from Cloud9 with their vests would have died. Just literally died. Um, especially Fnatic, you know. Who, uh, you know, because Crims is bald, he has to wear a hat, even in blazing heat. And, you know, Flush's beard, obviously, retains a lot of heat. But um, you could actually see each other's screens. The players could actually see each other's screens. And Cloud9 did this. They, they, and I, I don't blame them for doing it. Could they see the screens? I thought they yeah. could just see each other's faces and they were flashing each other. Oh, well, maybe. But, I, I, yeah, maybe not the screens, then, sorry. But they could look over and tell whether you were flashed. Yeah, they could, they, that's the thing. They could see the other guy's yeah. face, yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Like, yeah, they were just sorry, on a slight bad. curve. Yeah. Just because because someone might think now that like nothing's yeah. gonna be one, he's like, no, no, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. behind him now. Like, no, 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 but no, no, sorry, but yeah, they could sort of see reactions based on what yeah. was happening on okay. the screen. I should, I should, I should be clear about that. So you've got that problem there, right? And again, I don't blame. Nothing's an experienced player if he's able to do that. I don't blame him. It just shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't. It, sh- it shouldn't be enabled. Is, is is the bottom line? And it was. They were able to tell. Equally, when you're listening to the point of view stream and Cloud9 say, I've heard they've just called this strat, let's all rotate to B. That should yeah. never be happening. No. $100,000 on, on the line. And that's happening in a tournament. So I think the players have took it pretty easy on ESL, actually, in, in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Because, Put it this way. Exactly. Think about the game where CLG were the ones who said, like, oh, we can hear Fnatic. They can hear what we're saying, rather. They were the ones who said it on camera, and Fragbyte put the video clip where they said, like, oh, they can hear what we're saying or something, or, like, we can hear the casters. Yeah. If CLG yeah. won that game, so that so it was fine for them. If they'd have lost it, they'd have been well within their rights to go fucking ape shit and be like, oh, like, say say you had that unfortunate scenario that happened to our, our good buddy Nanowar, okay? Now, what people sure. don't realize is that it was literally true, and other players told Nanawa, like, yeah, I could also hear the casters. So what happened to Nanawa in this StarCraft II tournament was he tried a really ballsy all-in early in the game, and it just so happened his opponent perfectly scouted him. Now, yes, obviously that's entirely possible just by the guy knowing what build was coming or just guessing. But Mm. because that happens at the same time Nanawa himself can hear the casters, it's a pretty reasonable complaint to be like well fuck this he must have heard me or he could have heard me even the fact that he could whether he did or not is something that you can see how that would tilt you and infuriate you now the players didn't go all that ape shit here but they could have and they wouldn't have been like outside of the realms of possibility the biggest problem here is i can actually i think you can make cases for the things you were talking about before like the fan interaction all these things but the point is no one i know would make the fan interaction and be like i think it's really cool that like the fans can interact and some of them every now and then can shout out like a gank's coming and every now and then the players maybe hear like a cool thing of the no one ever says that so really it's not even a fair discussion someone's got to figure out a way of doing it where you can have that fun interaction but without these downsides if you do that now we can have a real debate over which is better and and hey maybe some people will come away from the booths the reason i go with the booth at the moment is because it's the only one i know that can get rid of these problems as far as i know almost for certain so until Mm. someone figures out a better solution i think we have to go with that for now because like you're saying under no circumstances like i mean the flashbang one in itself probably shouldn't happen, but that's not even as egregious as the idea that you either hear what the other team's saying or the oh, fucking yeah, casters. Yeah. That, that can never happen because yeah. that, that really could just ruin an, an, a, an amazing game, you know, in like a 1v1 or something. We all know, yeah. we can all think of scenarios where it could ruin the whole thing. And of course, in 1.6, you know, if anything like that went on, I mean, it was it was treated very seriously indeed. Yeah, yeah. And CSGO needs to get to that uh, uh, standard, I think, where, where a tournament of this stature, like, don't get me wrong, right? For some piss pot land tournament with like a small prize fund, maybe you let it slide. This is going to be one of the premier events on the calendar. 
So it's got to have premier standards for me. Well, think about back in the day. One of the reasons people always used to complain about the booths is that they always said you either get a really cheap booth, which doesn't do much. Okay, I can believe that. Or you yep. go the proper route, like the proper soundproofing. And they always used to say, oh, it costs a lot of money. I forget the figure, like there's $10,000 or whatever. The problem is, yeah, when your whole prize purse is 30000 okay, I get it. You can't afford the 10000 The prize purse is now like 200 300K. And we all know these companies are getting money pumped into them by sponsors. So actually, 10K is no longer an excuse for you. That's actually a viable expense that you should probably go out on. It, especially, unfortunately, if now your fans know that you, you, the integrity of the tournament is compromised. Yeah, absolutely. And another way in which I thought it was compromised, and this will be the final debate about ESL, because I'm, I'm sure when they watch the VOD, maybe they think we've been a bit unfair. But these need to be valid criticisms. And when you're an industry leader, you're going to get more criticisms than anyone else, and should it's not just because we're in the we're, we're in the doghouse with ESL in the fuck ESL clubhouse. Yeah, yeah, it's not just because of that. Although that might be true, but that does make it better, though. It, <laughs> it makes, makes it more sweeter. Fun. Yeah. yeah, but you know, when you're an industry leader, criticism needs to you know you. It's more important to criticize an industry leader than it is some guy that doesn't know what the fuck they're doing. Right? Oh, yeah, simple as that. So, the point of view streams. Massive bone of contention for me, anyway, to begin with. Just their existence, I find egregious. I don't like it. I'll come to that in a second, though. But what we had with the point of view streams, of course, was the fact that there was no release date on them. So some teams had the advantage, the luxury, of being able to watch VODs of a POV stream overnight of the team they're then going to play. So you imagine if you get a demo or if you get a game, you can disseminate tactics, but now you can also break down communications, rotations, how they yeah. change calls on the fly when certain things happen. It's a huge tactical advantage. And again, it's one that ca you cannot allow the broadcast in any way, in the same way hearing a caster's voice, you can't allow VODs of that to go out mid-tournament and allow it to prevent, potentially pervert the course of an event. Uh, so I just wanted to get your thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, that, that's the big problem, isn't it? Like, here, here's the best way, here's the analogy for you, okay, Rich. Mm. So let's say every day I walked, I walk, go to work on the morning and I go to the coffee shop, first of all, I get my coffee and I see the barista and she's this young, nubile young woman, very sexual, very exotic, you know, as they often are, you know, yeah. in England. So you go, you go to there, you see her, okay, and you think to yourself, oh, I, I you know, obviously sexually attractive woman, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to think what it'd be like. If someone just told me, like, psst, if you go to this URL, you can just see, like, a, a live stream of her when she's in the shower. Listen, that would be morally wrong for me to listen to that. But I'd obviously do it. I'd obviously click on it, and I'd obviously watch it. The whole time I'd be like, this is wrong, but I'd be loving it. I'd be like, this is brilliant, actually. Part of me would be like, this is brilliant. Then about about seven minutes later, I'd be like, this is so wrong. I, I'm never going to do that again. I promise. Uh, uh, Not until what tomorrow. Happens, and what then happened seven minutes later, Duncan? What happened, what, why seven minutes? Well, that's when I finished crying. I've cleaned up, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, had to, I've turned off uh, the Rolling Stones paint it black so it's not muffling the sounds and the screams, you know. But yeah, anyway, so I, I wouldn't, I would know it was wrong, but I would definitely do it. So that's how I feel about these streams. I really want to listen to them, Rich. I want to hear these tactics. I want to hear what calls they make. I want to hear which players are idiots and don't listen to the strats. But I know I probably shouldn't be listening to this. I know that, unfortunately, it's going to be used in the in, in essentially for evil. Like, I mean, I'm I, I got to say, fair play to Pronax that he even came out before the final and said, actually, I will definitely listen to these vods of the American teams and yeah. and, and try and figure stuff out based on them. Yeah. So yeah, there's no again same with same with the the booth situation. If you could find a way to release these after the event in a way that it didn't affect anything, which even then it still would because people still go and watch them who are teams. If you could yeah. find a way, yeah, let's have a discussion then. But I can't find a way at the moment to get rid of advantages for certain people that that will spoil the game in some sense. Mm. I mean, for me, like, look, it, it's like you said. Uh, I'm not going to use a sexual analogy, and I'm definitely not going to allude to masturbation in 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 my. Uh, um, although all of those things you did say do ring incredibly true. Um, uh, apart from the seven minutes thing, I, I aim to get that high one day. But uh, yeah. let's <laughs> let's um, let's just break it down, right? Basically, what we're doing is, right, well, rather, what I was I was grandstanding there, by the way, Rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was no, no one's yeah. ever done seven minutes. No, <laughs> no. One. I don't believe it. No, no, no. So um, the, um, the, the, the what ESL are effectively saying is. 
that it's okay for this uh, feature of a tournament to go ahead, one that we know can impact on the uh, integrity of a tournament because it can be used as a, a, a tool to anti-strat and, you know, and, and other things. Not only that, I think it creates an extra layer of pressure for teams because we just had it on Envious and nobody's really picked up on this. And I've been told the translation's genuine. Now, I don't know if you did hear about this, but apparently there was some slight is Islamic, anti-Islamic comments made about Freakazoid. Uh, did you hear about this? Yeah, so I saw the translations from the, the French guys. I mean, and I, you know, I, I, I asked a French friend and he was like, yeah, that's, that's a fair summary of what was said. So, you know, we're going to, it was basically, I think the one line that would stand out was perhaps being slightly offensive was, you know, um, he's a Muslim and he's doing Ramadan. So let's feed him some ham, I think it was. Which, you know, look, we, we know France and, and you know, the, the sort of secularism and everything that's going on culturally, it's a little bit different. But here's the thing, yeah. if that blows up, let's say, I know, they're sponsored by a Saudi Arabian company, like Saudi Arabian airline or something, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. Right? And then that blows up. No, again, should, shouldn't say that. <laughs> okay. Shouldn't what, the Saudi that. Arabian airline blows up, Rich? Okay. Shouldn't say that. You're putting me in bad territory. That sounds, now, like, that was, that sounds like that was staged, mate. Uh, uh, and, just no, that, no, God, no. Um, I live in Birmingham, mate. There's no chance of that. Uh, I'm, I'm multicultural to the core. What I mean is that that is noticed yeah. at a greater level than perhaps you know it, it should have been. And they, they're like, well, this is anti-Islamic. This is outrageous. Uh, we're pulling the sponsorship. Now, should something that's ultimately said in private, and that's what team communications are, should something that's said in private be like in your mind? Oh, what if what if this goes viral? <laughs> like, should that be on your mind while you're trying to play a game and win a tournament? I don't think it should be. So what no, ESL that, are effectively that's going too far, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So what ESL are effectively saying is something that creates an extra barrier of pressure to the players, something that can have huge negative impacts on the players outside of their careers, the career prospects, perceptions. You know, like. Just for example, like, what if, what if someone said, oh, you know, all Americans are dirty fucking trash anyway, right? And you're like an organization like Envious, right? Let's say Envious say it since we're talking about them anyway. Like, fuck Americans, they're all dirty trash. Well, Envious is ostensibly like an American organization. Yeah, yeah. So their fan base is fucked, isn't it? Like, they're going to get loads of negative hate. What if they got pressure? What if Envious got pressured into dropping the team? Now, you don't say it can't happen because esports proves every day it can. That mob mentality will prevail. So I don't like it on that basis. So my point is, should should that be there just because fans like it? I don't think so. I think that's bullshit, frankly. There's also a big problem I've noticed with that, which is uh, something you'll recognize, which is, you know, with scandals where people, I mean, obviously, like, we've been involved in them, where either someone says something that someone doesn't like or there's a triggered yeah. word, etc. One of the reasons that it always feels unfair when that happens is because it's not uniform. Like someone else has said the same thing or worse and either they were a liked person, so therefore it was ignored, or it just wasn't picked up for that one time. For whatever reason, no rhyme or reason behind it, you know. And so it feels kind of capricious when it happens to the one person and then it gets blown out of proportion. There have been two incidences based on POV streams, both times with the – let me think – both times with the French team, actually, it was both times with Envious, which admittedly, you have to realize a lot of people dislike Envious. They think they're arrogant. They think MBK cries, okay? So people are looking for things about Envious yeah. to yeah. fuck them up. Yeah. So, the, uh, so at the last major, there was a situation where Envious had said something, I think it was about Na'Vi when they were playing them, where they'd said something along the lines of like, mm. I think Shocks was like, like, kill these Ukrainian dogs, like they are scum or something, which let's face it. First of all, translated into English from French, like these guys, their languages are more poetic. They're, the way they speak is more evocative, you know. Then yeah, yeah, they're yeah. not literally saying that in the same sense, you know. So anyway, there's that. But secondly, there was a piece of context about that that was really unfair, which is that no one bothered to translate what the Ukrainians were saying. So yeah. people who are speaking in Russian, okay, I know for a fact were saying things like, well, for a start off, when the Russians kill people, they say stuff like, oh, it's fucking bitch, like, oh, fuck this prostitute whore, I will kill him. Like, those are the same match that they're saying that, but no one translated that. Yeah. And yet, here's the amazing thing, Rich. The fans who were getting upset about it had fucking Ukrainian flags on. So are we to believe that they weren't listening to the POV streams, that they, that they honestly thought that their players never said anything, but they're envious of this evil team. No, 
Now, the same exact scenario happened at this land, believe it or not. I didn't know this until I saw that video where it was the funny moments on the POV stream. Because remember, this is all about Freakazoid and how he's been unfairly treated. Then you go to the POV stream and Freakazoid makes a joke, which again also is a joke where he says like, oh, they're smoking. I hope they fucking die of cancer. Well, isn't dying of cancer worse than like saying they're going to feed pork to a guy who's Muslim or whatever? I'd argue that it's worse to be die of cancer then but again i don't want any of these people to get in trouble i'm not saying yeah, get same, in trouble same. i'm not saying get freaks out but unfortunately you can see how it's not even a fair treatment here it's not like it is just one set of plays is really out of bounds i'm sure almost everyone said some crazy shit at some point in time during however many hours of a tournament was on pov stream well so yeah unfortunately, this is why you don't we, stream when you play yeah yeah but even <laughs> if even if you punish some of these people, it's never going to be fair anyway. So I can see how this is just a minefield that I don't want players to be forced to walk through. And then one guy, what? listen, if the game gets big enough, someone's going to get fired over this. Someone's going to get kicked off an awesome team. Yep. You're going to break up a great team. Who wants that, man? Just for a few funny moments. Or if anything, yeah. let's do it the other way. If everyone wants the funny moments, save the POV VODs, go through them, only take out funny shit that doesn't offend people, if that's possible, and just make a funny VOD after the games. Isn't that, isn't that a way around it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I, I just don't like it because it's like you say, it's coming. It's coming. That one time somebody says something, maybe they drop an end bomb. I don't know. But it's coming. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and when it comes, everyone's going to, like, they're going to go after that person. He's got, you know, they're going to get driven out of the scene. And they're going to be thinking, like, hang on a minute. You know, now, why has this happened to me? Now, the. the the thing is, the teams are giving sort of tacit approval to ESL to, to keep this in. I think ESL said last time this debate was brought up, when I, when I put my video out there, they were saying, oh, well, we do ask the teams if it's okay to broadcast uh, the POV streams. They've got to agree to it. If I was teams, if I was a manager of a team, I would not agree. Absolutely wouldn't. You know, and, and I think it's uh, succinctly summarized by at the start of the Fnatic Cloud9 final, I think it was nothing who said... Right at the start on Cobble, uh, just just a disclaimer, guys, watching the POV stream. We're going to trash talk these guys unbelievably, but we're, we really like them and we really respect them. You shouldn't have to say that. That shouldn't be no. in your mind at the start of a final, ever. And, you know, you think about mainstream sports, players aren't mic'd up. You know, it just, it, some things are sacred in my opinion. And, and what, is, what you use to motivate a team, even if it's not the thing you would say in polite company, it's a competitive environment. And, and that should be sacrosanct. It should be protected. Not broadcast to the slobbering mob that are going to fucking buy pitchforks and you know, get you fired at the first thing you say that they don't like. You can't... Well, especially as... I mean, listen, public's one thing. The public will do it as well. Like, yours, I, I might have something on board there that eventually they'll get under their ire up and, and often they will get annoyed that something will happen, wh whether it's some warning or whatever. But what I'm even more worried about is as gaming gets bigger and seeing, since CSGO is like, at the moment, CSGO is in the great position of like permeating all of the esports. People yep. from Dota watch it, people from yep. LoL watch it. Yep. So yep. As, it, as it gets super massive, if it gets exponentially big enough, some fucker like Anita Sarkassian is just going to come in and find where they called someone a bitch and then fucking ruin the whole game, isn't she? By getting some company, you know, like people with the pull of that. I don't want those people coming in and ruining CS. So if we can just take that away from them, they've got no grounds to even start that shit. Have they? And, 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 and just to, if everyone wants to get a tinfoil hat on, just to obviously do, say that Intel do sponsor the, the Anita Sarkeesian uh, project that she was involved oh, in. Jesus Christ. So, and you can Google that. So just, just saying, just saying, just saying. But let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's, uh, we'll leave it there, ESL. We have made our views known. We welcome you flying me and Duncan to Germany to interview Carmack about this. Anytime, <laughs> anytime, right? <laughs> there you go. I'm never getting that invite again. Right. Well, so, except the way it has to work, Rich, is I have to sit in another room with yeah, a wall between yeah, yeah, and I have yeah. to feed you in an earpiece. Yeah. Ask him about this. Ask him about this, Richard. Yeah. I have been instructed by the man who <laughs> shall not be named. Uh, <laughs> Whoever he may name. be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will call him. Duncan X. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Wait, wait. We will call him Mr. Shields. Right. So anyway, let's uh, <laughs> let's move on to the roundup of uh, of the news. Uh, let's pick out the best stories. Uh, da, 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 da. What have we got that's going on? I did have this planned in my head, but uh, it's uh, uh, oh, okay. So we'll do a bit of NA news. I know, I know you like uh, like a bit of NA. Um, 
I thought this was an interesting one. Over the course of the the um, series so far, we have talked about Elevate and you know what are they going to be doing in, in terms of NA, where they're going to be structured. Obviously, you know they've got some players on there that have some 1.6 pedigree, and you know it, it kind of flat to deceive a little bit. Well, uh, after all of the sort of uh, drama um, around what happened with Professor Chaos and Nihilum and, 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 and you know when he was part of denial and all that bullshit, uh, he's now stepped down. He's now just just quit, and and yeah. people and, and it basically said he's he's not going to play competitively again. Uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. So, I mean, it's it's a small snippet of news. I don't think it's seen changing, but I just wanted to get your thoughts about how that impacts on Elevate and how much of uh, an important cog in the machine uh, was Professor Chaos. I mean, the thing is, since he only just joined up with them recently, mm. yeah, I, I get I get the feeling, as, ni- as cynical as it might sound, like, listen, obviously these are all steps down from him. Like, he was in a team before that was, in theory, better and was going places and had had that result at the ESEA LAN, with the beaten Cloud9. So it feels like what happened was he joined this team, which, let's face it, unfortunately doesn't have many skilled players left in it. All the best players basically left and they have all kind of the supportive players left over and the leftovers from other teams. I get the sense he probably joined this team, played the first two days of scrims. They got shit on totally. And he was like, actually, fuck this. I think I'm just going to quit, mate. Like, I hope this was like, you know, maybe, maybe some, uh, we, we catch lightning in a bottle and we turn it around and we're like the leftovers who come back to the rain the scene. Actually, no, this is basically Rich. Like, he's probably the best player on that team. So this is sort of like if yeah. Emilio Estevez had walked into the Mighty Ducks and gone, you guys are just shit. I fucked this, actually. <laughs> I'm going back to working as a janitor. Like, this isn't worth it. You're terrible. Nothing could turn this around. And P.S., you the fat kid. Fuck you, mate. I'm out of here. Like- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, to, to be fair, to be fair, to balance it out, uh, and I, I'd love to see that version of Mighty Ducks. I'd lo- you should I d- direct My director's reading. cut, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just my, Mighty Dicks, a seven-minute film <laughs> by uh, Duncan Thorin Shields. Anyway. So let's um let, let's just talk about the the reasons because maybe it happened as you've theory crafted there, but a lot of people were saying it was just where he lived. Apparently, the internet was absolutely terrible. Okay, so <laughs> that sounds like such a sketchy excuse, doesn't it? And that's like, sorry guys, my internet is broken. I must go home to my people now. Just like what the fuck? <laughs> it was working before, wasn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, just, just, uh, just, just thought. Maybe I'd, because uh, his name's Professor Chaos. Maybe he realised he would never be able to catch up with his rival, the Coon, or whatever that was. Like <laughs> Cartman's name. <laughs> That's going to be my reasoning, you know. I, I, I guess so. Uh, Renegades. Uh, we a little bit of a, a little bit of a clash again of, of scheduling here. Renegades uh, are going to have to miss the face at season two finals, which I'm sure is a, a blow to them because the ESL One Cologne Asian qualifier in Malaysia is being hosted at the same time. But uh, there were some people, I think, trying to light this as a torch paper. Uh, oh, ESL have done it again. They're ruining another event. It's the fucking Asian qualifier, you know, like. It's not like they put a major tournament on at the same time. Unfortunately, as CSGO grows, you are going to see more conflicts here. And as much as I'd like to go in on, on ESL, and we've just spent fucking 30 minutes doing that, you can't go in on them about this. I don't no. think so anyway. Maybe you feel differently. I just think it's one of those things, you know. Plus, here's the thing. Okay, sure. Like, it would have been nice to see them face it. And who knows, maybe they could even have a, their own impressive run and, and show us all a lot yeah, of good yeah. stuff. But it's very important to play in these majors. And unfortunately, face it is not a major. So if it's a choice yeah. between the two, you've got to go for the major, especially because, let's face it, it's almost a lock that they're going to win that Malaysian qualifier. Like, who's going to beat yeah. them? Plus, yeah. you know... Malaysia is a cool place to hang out. You know, dude looks like a lady. <laughs> you know, I can imagine that obviously he's having a lot of fun. Sarkeesian's there. coming, mate. You want to be, you want to be careful. <laughs> Knock, knocking back a few beers. Listen, I actually feel like I might be the one who can defeat Sarkeesian. I think it's my destiny, right. Rich. Or uh, I will just go down in a blaze of glory. You know, one of those two. Well, I think I'm the bit, one who could battle right now. Yeah, well, uh, Stephen Destiny Benell has, has tried. and, and <laughs> Actually, so. yeah, mate, you might be right. I might, I might step back off that one. <laughs> So just be careful. Uh, I'm not yeah, even I, allowed I, to use the N-word freely. So if he, can, if he can't win, maybe all hope is lost. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, I, think, I think some fights are too big even for you. But, but I admire your pluck. 
Uh, but here's what I'll say as well, just to contextualize why these majors are important. Obviously, you're a fledgling brand. You're the LA Renegades. Um, that's what they're calling themselves, you know, obviously for the League of Legends team, just Renegades, I guess, for the rest of it. But um, they're this brand, you know, they did the thing with the bandanas. They're really trying to get brand awareness out there for marketing purposes. That that logo will be in a sticker if they go to a major, right? And the that's sticker money, logo. Yeah, exactly. And the sticker money's good. But brand recognition is something that you can't put a price on. And I think that sticker will actually sell like hotcakes. Because uh, it's like you say, it's a cool logo. It'll look good on the side of a gun. I can, I can see that taking off. So big picture here, it makes more sense for them to be involved in a major. And you say, it should be a cakewalk for them out in, in Malaysia. It, they just should be able, straight in, even a Renegades that's not playing particularly well should be able to breeze that. They've proven they're the best team in Australia. W where else is someone going to come from? So, um, yeah, they're, they're doing the right thing. I, I hope Face it don't see it as too much of an affront. They're not that kind of company, so I doubt they will. But, yeah, Renegades... I mean, they know like ESEA. They won't, they won't be banning them from the next season, you know, childishly oh. in sort of an, an unduly capricious manner until a Super League's formed, then quickly forget all that because you want to make an exclusive league. Oh! Uh, that, I was just hype. That was just speculation there. It's just a yeah. hyper, hypothetical yeah. what they might have done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe, yeah. We all we all know about ESEA and their, their wonderful videos, which uh, make us uh, have lots of faith in humanity, all kinds of humanity. Maybe ESEA will work as kind of the magnet to draw Anita Sarkassian and those types away when they see the sort of shit that they've done, and we'll mm -hmm. be saved from that. Maybe that's ultimately their true destiny: is to kind of be the sun into which the nukes of Sarkassian and her cronies detonate. Well, let's see. That's my dream. ES ESWC, they've announced their groups. It's the tournament I can't get you excited about, no matter how hard I try. So ESWC in Montreal. not this week, mate. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, just saying. ESWC in Montreal. Uh, it, it, it's got some good teams there. I mean, I did hear that... Um, you do. <laughs> I, I did hear that Na'Vi could be yeah. having visa issues. Which, I mean, given I would argue they've got to be one of the favorites to, to yeah, yeah. you know, that, that could be a huge blow for them. It's always uh, sad that the sort of current political landscape can lead to Did these you see issues. the news that broke a couple of hours ago? Uh, yeah, about Hiko. Flip side? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to come at that right at the end. I thought we'll yeah. end on that because yeah. uh, okay. I, like, uh, I do like to talk about Hiko. It's always fun. And I got a great okay. anecdote for you when the show on, which is going to blow you up. Okay, let's do it. Mind. <laughs> but let's just talk about ESWC. Come on, let's let's just oh, try. By the way, before I forget, everyone yeah, well, has to go and watch that Hiko reacts to Cloud Nine at ESL. Oh, ESEA, right. you know, where they took the Hitler reacts. Yeah. That was fucking yeah. down. I love Hiko, but that was that was funny as fuck, mate. Yeah, that was good. Like, yeah, it was on the front page of Reddit. I'm sure you guys can find it. But yeah, seriously, the thing is, it doesn't matter how many times I see that clip from Downfall, and yeah, you know, I speak amazing, isn't it? relatively decent German. Yeah, but it's. Conversa conversational yeah. level German, let's say. That's why it hurt you so much that ESL betrayed you, didn't it? You were like, yeah. I was supposed to be the chosen one. You could have yeah. bridged the gap between Britain and Germany. That was it. That was the plan all along. It just didn't happen like that, though. ESL, just, uh, you know, it's, it's a massive letdown. But, um, you marked ESL. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Varum. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, this is... Uh, um, you know, this this is a, 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 a an, an issue that I think it, it is sad. It it is sad that this is uh you know sort of happening to a team like Navi with the, with the visa issues and yeah, you know, it's only for the Russian players. It's not for the Ukrainian players. But I, I don't think Navi are the kind of team that can really use the stand in. Uh, I think so much of what they do is like based around teamwork and stuff. So whether they'll still attend, I don't know. And then you're left with well, what happens? How do you get a last minute replacement? So that could impact on the tournament. But anyway, we had a look at the groups. I'll just read out the groups that got announced. And uh, come on, this has got to get you. This has got to get you excited, all right? This okay. has got to. All right. So Group A, right? Cloud Nine, flip side with Hiko as a stand in, of course, which we'll come to in a moment. Yeah, his old mates, Cloud yeah, yeah. Nine, Hiko. Yeah, yeah. Keyed Stars, and the Canadian winners, Zpug Gods. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even say that as so it's a real name, can you? Right. Okay. So there you go. That's Group A, mate. Group B, right? NIP. Yeah, you, you like a bit of them. Team Liquid with Badron and Company, right? LDLC White. Yeah, they've been upsetting people again. Yeah? 
Eh? Maybe they'll get involved in the French Revolution when it definitely happens soon. And the Chinese team, key you. Look at you. I can tell by your face. You're like, do you know what? I need to revise the SWC here. Right? There's two more groups, Duncan. Group C, Navi with visa problems. Titan, or as I've affectionately come to call them, Shiten. Because if you're American, shite's kind of like shit. Shite is pre-shit, actually. It's the soft bit before the shit is formed. That's anthropologically correct. But anyway, so Shiten, right, who are in free fall, definitely need to have a good tournament soon. Like, I can't even believe that the change hasn't already happened, like, because it just needs to. Luminosity, who actually, we didn't really talk about them at at this event. I thought they were going to be the NA team that might surprise people. I still think that's possible. I'm not going to go as far as, uh, I think it was, Mo- Moses might even have said this, where he thinks if they stay together and keep working, I, I, he, I think he said that they could pot- potentially be the number one team in NA. Who? I think Moses said that about Luminosity. Luminosity? Yeah. Listen, I don't think it's ridiculous. I know everyone bagged on yeah. Luminosity and obviously they had a dog shit event there. Mm. But... Uh... I, yeah, I kind of think that I, they haven't had that long together. So, yeah, I, I actually think there's some upside to that team. I think there's more upside to them than CLG, put it that way. There's a bold statement for you. Well, okay, okay. SK Gaming, yeah, did all right at Gfinity in the first outing. Lots yeah. going on there behind the scenes, though. Group D, Envious, right? Are they going to be out drinking or are they going to be like, you know what, we can't yes, do that? definitely. They're in a country <laughs> that speaks French, mate. This is, it's <laughs> over. It's over, mate. <laughs> CLG. Who, of course, yeah. made it to the semis, right? And this event. Renegades. And my mates, Renegades. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Xbox Seminar. Upset potential. And then from South Africa, from the streets of Joburg, Bravado Gaming. Right? Who have the Bravado just, to prevent the CS team? Mate, they'll just mug everyone. Why not? Yeah. They're winning one way or another. So if that, and of course, that, that's a joke. If. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just disclaimer yeah. right, again I've got South African what, mates I'm, I'm immune what size uh, tyre burning tyre do you want to put around your neck <laughs> so please tell me you're excited now Duncan I think that's awesome I'm actually looking well, here, forward to that tournament here's too. the weird thing this is actually reminding me in a weird way of the last Gfinity because the thing was because the top teams dropped out of Gfinity it opened up the whole tournament where you didn't know who would get out of groups necessarily. Then you didn't know who would win the semis and you didn't know who would win the event. Actually, there was some there was some room within the tiers as to what could happen here. So yeah, yeah, actually the parity of the events opened right up. Like for example, the only group I think is like ridiculously weak is group B. And I'm, I'm afraid that standard like NIP Illuminati bullshit where I'm pretty sure every tournament magically gives NIP the easiest group because everyone knows the NIP fan base getting to a, the playoffs is mega for your tournament. They have the most fans all around the world. That's, that doesn't even go, that goes without saying, right? They're, they're like the Manchester United where some kid in Bombay has a Manchester United jersey on right now who doesn't even know who Chelsea is, you know? That sort of, yeah, that's yeah, the sort yeah. of reach yeah. Nip has, you know? So yeah. it helps everyone that Nip gets out of their tournament. So in a weird way, even that being the easy group isn't that bad. Now, with that said, yeah, there's upset potential in every single group here. I mean, obviously the sexiest storyline is that Hiko is going to go and play against Cloud9. So we all know a million idiots, if he loses, are going to go bombard him with like, you made the wrong choice. How do you feel about the wrong choice? Does it hurt you to see others succeed? And you could, you know, like all the lovely stuff that people do do on the internet. But let's be real. Ad- admittedly, he's replacing World Edit, who was one of the better players in that team. But Hiko's a good player. And he's playing with Simple, who apparently doesn't even fucking care about communicating or team play anyway. He just wrecks people's faces. So they could win that if it's a best of one. Is it a best of one format? I think in the groups it's going to be, actually. Yeah, it uh, is. Best uh, of one yeah. round robin. So, hey, they can win that game. Simple alone is so nuts. If Hiko just plays decently, that, that's a winnable game. I'm not saying they will win. Then you've got Keed Stars in the same group who have good tactics. That's yeah. a pretty sexy group A. Group yeah. B, I think, is dog shit because it relies... The only upset potential really is LDLC White beats Liquid, which might happen. Who knows? But even then, I won't dis Liquid that much. That'll say LDLC White will definitely beat him. Group C... Group C, obviously, Navi, if they'd had the players, would be an obvious one. I think they'd get through no matter what. But with the stand-ins, hey, that becomes wide open. And then Group D, I still feel like Envious is just going to get out of that group. But who knows between CLG and Renegades? I think that's a real toss-up. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I'd, I'd I probably think back Renegades, actually, on that one. 
I think Group B is the closest to an obvious group, and even then, who knows with Liquid? Right. Who yeah, knows? Yeah. yeah. So there you go. I'm. I'm. You know, I, I'm loath to use the word hype, but uh, I, I I can get excited about that as a tournament. And of course, I'll be wanting to see the Chinese team do well. Well, Ki- but the thing is, if they did, I mean, bearing in mind they're in a group. Put it this way: if Kiyi, Kiyu, beat Ki-Yu, me, sorry. that's when you'll see a fucking meltdown of the internet. If that was to happen, now I don't think it'll happen. I think it's very no, unlikely. No. But if something like that happened, holy shit! Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, like, that's, look, that's I, not the I, name I, of I remember, one of their players, by the way. I remember when you used to see Tai Lu. Rich, that's not the name of one of their players. Holy shit. That's uh, <laughs> oh, it's just God. the words holy, it, holy shit. Yeah, it's yeah. happening. It's happening. Um, <laughs> but like, like so, so Kiyu, right? Like, I remember when Tai Lu, uh, you obviously you go into 1.6 tournaments, they beat Fnatic uh, a, a couple of times, I think, in group stage games. Um, you know, the, the, the Fnatic that were winning tournaments, <laughs> you know? Um, the, the the Chinese 1.6 team was really well developed, actually, compared to what we've got with CSGO. Um, but if if a Chinese team did well at an event like this, it, it changes, I think. I think it could give us some real traction in that region. And I want that because I think we're still capped, actually, at how big we can be because we haven't moved into the Asian markets. We don't have like an, an Eastro or um, We Made Fox, uh, as they went on to be called. Um, you know, in Korea, we we don't have a Tai Lu equivalent in CS:GO yet. You know, and we need them. I think when we get them, boom! You know, I think I think the roof really blows off this. So I'm going to be cheering on for for those guys, and you can you can stop smirking, right? Wipe like that smirk <laughs> okay. off your face, mate. All right. So yeah. So anyway, ESWC. We're, come on, you're going to watch it now, aren't you? I mean, yeah. There's there is a rabid fan base out there in China, and if we can just get to some young guys. <laughs> You're a fucking idiot. As if you've been sat there with a smirk on your face, trying to work that in. <laughs> that is like a new fucking <laughs> low right there. It wasn't there, even like. good, was it? No. no. <laughs> wasn't even good at any level. Oh, well, fuck it. It's late where you are, so uh, I'll let you off. Right. So anyway, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's wrap up the last two things. DreamHack Austin announced DreamHack's finally going to go over and try and conquer the states, doing it in Austin, Texas. That's where my employers, the Daily Dot, are based, so they're hyped about it. We can get all of our staff and crew out there, and I'm hoping that in 2016, I'm, DreamHack is still employing me, maybe after this show, who knows. Uh, we, we, we've done a bit of everything on this one. But, um, I mean, again, this is uh, a, a, perhaps a, a strange location in some people's eyes, but actually, this has generated loads of hype on the internet, this, this announcement. So uh, what do you think about that? Are you, are you happy to see CSGO going to Austin, Texas? Home I mean, of I'm guns? Glad, I'm definitely glad to see more events in America, especially because obviously the great – one of the things I love about DreamHack is they're one of the only tournaments that is still just a tournament circuit. You don't have to play a ridiculously long online league along with seven other leagues where you're playing every single night. So as a result, first of all, if you remember, all these tournaments I, – I, I, um, I might be wrong here, but is this part of DreamHack Open? Yeah, yeah, it's the two of us. Well, that immediately then means that local teams can qualify. So if you're an NA team, even if you don't get invited, you don't qualify, go to the BYOC, and there you go. You can get in the tournament, like LDLC White did at DreamHack Tours, and there you can maybe have a chance at an upset there. So that in itself is cool. That means that NA teams don't have to have the excuse of, like, we don't have a sponsor and stuff. Just get in a van, drive to Texas. That's all people used to do back in the CPL days. And it used yep. to make the NA scene so vibrant and so hyped, you know, that there was a way you could still get in if you were good. Then you add in the fact that obviously we haven't had a dream hack out there, so you'll get a different different feel. You have the the talent of dream hack will go out there, wink, wink. You know, people who like to go to Texas. Apparently, I don't know much about Texas. I've only been to Dallas, which is kind of crap, but yeah. and nothing like the TV show. Like there was no highfalutin no. business going on. No one even shot anyone. It was just a bunch of fat people in Dodge Rubbing. pickup trucks driving around. So. <laughs> You know, I'm, wait, I'm, but, I'm watching the stream now, and Sam's scrolling down the HLTV announcement. And if he scrolls too far, he's going to see a classic HLTV comment, which was "saw this and thought it was dream hack autism." <laughs> so don't <laughs> don't scroll yeah. down too far, Sam. Please, okay. whatever you do. But okay, um, the other thing is, I have actually heard. Again, I said like I haven't been there, but people always say within Texas, Austin's supposed to be the coolest place. That's the place that like all the hippie type people move to, and it's like the 
the place where people have fun and it's a party place and that's where all the cool concerts are. So if that's true, it sounds like the sort of place DreamHacks fit in, you know. And by the way, anyone who talks shit like, oh, why is it in Austin, not New York? Try and have a look where the fuck Jönköping is in Sweden. It ain't yeah. it ain't Gothenburg or whatever, mate. It's 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 not the best place. So th- I think Austin sounds fine. It'd be cool to have another event. Obviously, it's better yeah, to have more I, I, events actually, as well. You're right. Compared to like Jan Scherping, which is in the fucking like, Bible Belt of Sweden, like Swedish ridiculous drinking laws anyway, and then you've got Jan Scherping, this scenic... Yeah, it is, it is like Rednecksville in a, in, in a way, you know, for, from you would find in America out there. So actually, Austin's like... I couldn't believe it. Like, I was talking to the guys at the Daily Dot, and they were like, yeah, yeah it's super cool, super liberal out here. You know, everyone having a good time and that. So just saying... Um, you know, it, it could actually be amazing. Um, and I'm sure it will be because it's DreamHack and DreamHack are going to send me there, hopefully. So, and you too, unless you're in Korea again. So, I mean, it, it's it's a way weird though. So I think it's in May next year, right? So, mm. so, sign me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's hey, where's hey. the where's the contract? Hey. Where's the contracts at, Mike? Van. Also, you know what they say, Rich? Everything in America is bigger, so our pay must go up as be. well, mate. In Texas, but logically, I, yeah. And I'm hoping by that point, actually, my I've grown in stature, like figuratively, not literally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> although that might be good for me out there, I don't know. But uh, to the point where I can, I, we can have some real rock star ridership, like yeah, me yeah. and you can just go absolutely nuts, like. But just, I think you know, the only problem we have is that since we keep making it so public that like. There's, there's no way back with the SL. We are actually sort of driving our own leverage down, you realize, at every turn. We should hey, at least leave some glimmer of hope, you know. You know it's only a matter of time before, uh, you know, R- Ralph at ESL just picks up the phone to us and goes, look, we, we can never use you in a talent capacity, but how about you come and be our, like, advisors, you know? With the Consultant. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You watch, you watch. It'll happen, it'll happen. I think our, I think our leverage is up. I think we're at an all-time high, Duncan. Now, speaking of that, speaking of... Prima donnas and and uh, you know superstars. Hiko stepping in for flip side. So first of all, let's just talk about the thing on the surface value. I'll end the show with an outrageous anecdote, which I, I don't know whether to believe it or not, but I think it's brilliant if it's true. Um, so stepping in for flip side. Nobody saw this one coming. Um, now flip side uh, famously, you know, kind of struggled because of the simple issue. You know, he's banned from some tournaments, not banned from others. But Hiko going into a team of Ukrainians, how did, how did these guys like know each other? Like, how the fuck does this happen? Oh, is that a question? I thought I think yeah. you had an anecdote. You said no, no. The anecdote's coming right at the end of the show. Oh, right. I have no idea happen? because, as far as I could tell, the only tournament they've ever even attended would have, would have been something like. Well, the majors. There was the ESL one Cologne when they were that team, and then there was the one where Simple and Blade were involved with Hellraisers. But I still can't understand how they would have crossed paths. Like maybe I could believe. Okay, Hiko knows the Navi guys, but I wouldn't actually know how he knows any of the flip side guys. I wouldn't. I wouldn't really see any connection there. So I mean, look, uh, there's some theory crafting already going on about this, and it's that simply yeah. he's stepping in purely and purely because Cloud Nine are in the group. Is that is that is he that is he that still hung up on Cloud Nine? Like, well, if you want to make the conspiracy theory better, Rich, what you have to do is, if it's a rumor like that, where already it's like it might be mildly unfounded, probably just a little bit spiteful. So let's just make it sexier. What actually happened was he just said to Flipside, "Guys, come on, you don't win tournaments anyway. Using streaming money, I'll actually pay you ten thousand dollars to keep World Edit at home. Just say something about visas in the West. <laughs> you all think you're all simple out there, and you can't even fill out forms. And then I get to play against Cloud Nine, and I'm telling you guys, I'm I'm carrying that game. So simple, stay the fuck up away, and it's my show now. Okay, and simple was like, "What's your surname?" And he was like Martin. He like looks up and he goes, "Not German." Okay, you can play. Yeah, I was gonna say, I've, I've made it better, right? Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if they'd used the German stand-in, that would have been the best, I think. But yeah, it, yeah. it didn't happen. didn't happen. Next. Um, so here's, here's the anecdote. Here's the anecdote I've been hyping up, right? So I was yeah. like, you know, I've been doing some digging into all the stuff that was going on with NA, because obviously Valve, um, and I should probably, I'll mention this in passing, it was a report I did over at the Daily Dot. We had official confirmation that Valve have now said that the players that were banned in the match-fixing scandal and affected I by power, they cannot go to a major as a coach, an analyst. They cannot help or influence the team 
at all. In fact, they would even rather they didn't help them with preparation. Ideally, but, but, but they, they better get those boots because what if like Steel goes to Cologne and he just shouts out like they, they're going to come B probably next round? <laughs> like that, yeah. that 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 might be illegal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon it might be very much so. So we they they said that, and while I was digging into that story. It just in passing with somebody that was having a conversation with, they told me this story about Hiko in Nihilum, right? And you're going to love this because if this is true, it's one of the most funny things I've ever heard. Now, we all know that when Hiko was uh, touting himself around the teams, it, massive salaries we were talking about. It was to him and Skadoodle pairing originally, and then Skadoodle cracked. It was a massive signing on fee. You go to Cloud9, obviously. But then still, Hiko still obviously has star power. And he negotiated himself a pretty good contract, apparently, with the Nihilum organization. Now, apparently, there's a clause in his contract, right, where he doesn't have to practice past a certain time. Okay. Right? He just he can just, you know. Uh, Is time, it 420? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that but, a joke? No, no, no. There is no joke. There is no joke. There really isn't a joke coming. But apparently it's been causing a little bit of friction, a little bit of consternation, because when it hits that time, apparently he literally just like logs off and he doesn't say anything to anybody else. He's just like, I'm out, motherfuckers. Peace out. Like, you know, I like to imagine that. he literally just has like the power cable on the wall and he just pulls it out. Like even with everything on his computer, and, so, yeah. like, up, and he just drops from the server and they're like, oh, I guess that's the end of practice then. So, so I, I just thought that's incredible. Like, and then I started thinking about like, oh, individual players and the clauses they might have in the contracts. Like, if you're this is great. This is great for the game. Not, not great for teams, but great for the game. You See, know? I thought when you said it was a ridiculous answer, you were going to go like, he has this clause in his contract. No one's allowed to get more frags than him. So if he's, <laughs> if he's having a game, he's struggling 13 frags. You better not even accidentally pick up a grenade kill, motherfucker. You, know, you do not show me up. This is my team. It's a matter of time, probably, before we do get into that territory. But I mean, that's like, why that I, automatic guy got kicked out. He had one game where he just he was feeling it, and he was like, "Screw you, man! I, I can't hold back my talent." And then he had a game. He got like thirty frags. Hiko was like, "Well played. It's the last game you'll ever play in this fucking team. Get out the door now." He's like, so, "What? Are you going to kick me from this team? I already did." <laughs> You're already dead. <laughs> uh, Fist of the North Star reference. Um, so. I, just, just some thoughts about this though, because we did see Nihilum in, in, in free fall and then they made some roster changes. Yeah. You hear a story like that, and if you've got my kind of brain, Duncan, you start thinking maybe maybe there's some internal problems going on over that neck of the woods. Uh could be. I think I think part of the reason that they changed the players is that I mean a lot of those players weren't really that proven anyway. They'd had like one LAN. So I think they were kind of waiting to see well who are, I, okay, here's here's my theory. I think going into Neilum, that people like Semphis and Hiko didn't necessarily think like, well, we're, we're, this is going to go great. We're going to keep these players. I think it was always a case of like, we'll probably yeah. remove someone anyway. We'll, you know, we'll keep the ones that seem legit and then we'll bring in other good players. Like they already know Desi's a known quantity at this point anyway. He's played in other teams, he's been yeah. to Lance. So I think they were always going to upgrade at some positions. A prediction so, we got right, by the way, on this show. Yeah, yeah. So it could be accurate that they just they were sick of that guy and, hey, maybe there's other people to come in the future. I don't know. I have to say, though, I actually do hope that there are crazy because because here's the sad thing. Just selfishly, it does make me think if it's getting to the point where people can make create crazy things like that. Eventually, I can use this whole thing about career rich where I'm like, oh, I need to like cut back on some of the events I'm doing. So I have to be really choosy as to which ones I pick. You know, I really just want to work with the ones that like want to partner with my kind of talent, you know, and like provide me with the, the right vehicle. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, where are you going with this? Like no more DDK. He's out. I'm done with that guy. Yeah, so, mate. Or he pays me half his salary. One of the two. Okay. It's got to be one of the two. In fact, yeah. just, to, just to wrap up the show finally, of course, you're not going to be at, uh, at Valencia. Um, okay. And, and, and uh, you know, so, which I know lots of people are disappointed about. I did see uh, uh, a few posts on HLTV. I think it was after last week when you went in on Nip. There was some Portuguese guy in particular who said, when I see you at Valencia, I will smash your crooked teeth down your throat or whatever, you know, like classic anti-British sentiment. Um, and I was thinking, oh, I wish Duncan was at Valencia, just so. I know, just yeah. so he could meet this guy. I always get away with it. No repercussions, but, Rich. But Henry no G, Hen Henry G is going to stand in for you. And yeah. I've never been on an analysis desk with Henry G. Well, a lot of people don't realize yeah. this before CSGO uh, took off. Me and Henry G used to be casters. We were, we were partners. We could have been the uh, James Bardolph and DDK partnership. But he sold out. He wanted to go make some money, started working for uh, like some subsidiary of Microsoft doing Xbox games events, and the partnership was broken. 
Um, and I haven't done casting, and I had to kind of go back to square one. Henry G kind of fucked me over. So obviously I'm going to miss you. I'd rather you were there than Henry. Fuck Henry G. Fuck Easy yeah, Skins. Yeah. Fuck all of his hard work. I don't even steal people's skins, Rich. But I, I got this, which is a ginger beard. I okay. don't know if people can see that. It, it, it's described as a hipster beard, which I'm a little bit upset about because I don't think that describes your beard at all. But Not it was really the closest really. one I can get. And I promise you... I'm going to make Henry wear this. You know, I'm now hoping that the second you put it on him, some Portuguese guy bursts out the audience and starts punching <laughs> the fuck out. <laughs> that would be amazing, right? How dare you insult that IP? It, it, it's like, gonna, no, no, it's not him. It's a, it's a fake beard. It's a fake beard. It's oh, gonna, okay. that, mate, I'm not going to say that, mate. Keep it. Tra- tranquilo. It. Tranquilo. Mate, the thing that, is, I'll say to the Spanish, Portuguese actually. guy. I'll say to the Portuguese guy. He's also the guy who runs Easy Skins. And then he'll just... <laughs> Fucking what? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I lost the name. Uh, Stat track. Fucking Asimov or something. I don't know. Whatever the kids play with these days. Anyway, I think we can edit there. We've done prop humor. We've done racially tinged yeah, humor. Oh. We've done everything. We've, we've done the full repertoire. We've analyzed the scene. Uh, and of course, just as a final plug right at the end, we do want to thank Alpha Draft for allowing us to have our uh, ruminations and talk about CSGO. Uh, record streaming numbers tonight. So thank you all. The, the show is growing. Uh, that means we're going to be using that number there to increase our fee just a little bit. Pay me, pay us. Hashtag pay us. Um, but here's what I want to say as well. Obviously, if you like this content, Alpha Draft are out there. You can sign up to their website, no problem. They do um, you know, fantasy drafting. If you've not had a go on it, it's dead simple. You log in, you create an account. They've got uh, uh, fantasy drafts that you can buy into for big cash prizes, but there's free ones there. So even if you're a hard-up student or whatever, you can get on there. And it's dead simple. Every week, you just pick what team you think is going to do well based on the events that are going on. You pick the players. You've got a salary that you can balance out. And then whoever performs statistically well for you, if you finish in the top in a virtual league, you win money. And they've given out tons. I think I was it, like half a million or something? I don't even know, like last time I checked. It's an absolute fortune they've given out. So it's legit as fuck, right? That's my endorsement. So you should totally check it out and sign up to that. Thanks a lot for watching tonight. I've been Richard Lewis. He's been Duncan Shields. Uh, Take care. And of course, may all your drafts be alpha. See you next week.